invite our first speaker to the stage. It's uh, Sied Kloting. Kloting, sorry. My Dutch is not so good. And you can see the presentation's title is over there, and I'm sure that uh, Sied will be able to give you some background concerning the objectives of this talk. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a uh, great pleasure for me to be here today with you at this uh, centennial of IOGG and uh, to share with you some perspectives on the International Lithosphere Program. The uh, ILP is the happy and proud daughter of two mother unions, the IOGG and the IOGS. It, uh, was founded in 1980, so it's a little bit younger than uh, one of the mothers and also younger than the other mother. And it was set up rightly to be active at the interface of uh, IOGS and IOGG uh, setting on the state multidisciplinary projects of multi-scale character connecting very much the deep earth and the earth surface processes. So it is really a process-oriented program and uh, the prime goal is of course to connect people from different backgrounds. The, set, the state was set as mentioned earlier today in the, uh, in the morning uh, by the time ILP was uh, founded by a number of uh, highly successful and very uh, ambitious projects, including the International Geophysical Year, the International Upper Mental Project, and the International Geodynamics Project. And we are very happy with the continuing support of the two mother union, not only mental support, but also financial support, and of course, to uh, the different countries that give us also uh, substantial financial support. Headquarter of ILP is based in, uh, in Potsdam, and uh, through this setup, we can run, let's say, with a very small overhead and uh, concentrate really on the, uh, on the science. The uh, ILP covers all continents. Uh, since 1980, it has been uh, funding 70 projects, each of them involving quite a few number uh, of people. Some started pretty small, let's say with 50 people, and some have grown out really to big programs in themselves, like the International Continental Drilling Program and also the highly successful World Stress Map Project. What is for us very important is that we have this integrated approach, that we really operate on a global and uh, continental scale, but also are covering the, uh, the oceans. And what is a very specific characteristic, ILP is strictly bottom-up, and I think that is for the solid earth community very important because that means also down to earth and uh, to have the inspiration and the ideas from the community uh, at large and connecting them. The research themes are the geoscience of global change, contemporary dynamics and deep processes, and of course the lithosphere uh, itself. And when we talk about uh, the, uh, the lithosphere, we realize of course in connecting the deep earth to the surface that the mechanical properties of the lithosphere play a very important role. It was mentioned this morning by Alec that plate tectonics of course started with a focus on, uh, on horizontal motions. I can assure you that in uh, the lithosphere program there's a lot of space for quantifying and monitoring and modeling the vertical motions of the lithosphere. We have a structure in which task forces play a crucial role. These are programs on a scientific basis, on topics, again, process-oriented. And we have also coordinating committees, which are programs with a more regional uh, focus. The initiative comes from the scientific uh, community. They bring people uh, together, involving also a lot of young 
people, and that's a specific characteristic of, uh, of ILP, because we invest in the science of the future and the future of science. And of course, that cannot be done by uh, having not the, uh, the young generation deeply uh, involved. And also, basically, mentoring and coaching them, giving them the space to lead uh, some parts of the program and come forward with bright new uh, ideas. Let me give you a few examples of some task forces and of a regional coordinating committee. This is a project, a task force that started recently focusing on the seismic cycle at continental transform faults from seismological observations to forward uh, simulation. And uh, this project is focusing on the northern Anatolian fault. Beautiful natural laboratory and of course also of high societal uh, relevance. It all started, of course, with uh, borehole uh, projects. Also, a lot of uh, seismics uh, was carried out, and uh, in the coming phase, there will be also uh, a lot of uh, work uh, basically monitoring the, uh, the different motions uh, in the system through an integrated uh, observatory, uh, where the GPS stations are based at all wellheads. So it's quite an ambitious project involving a lot of people. This is another uh, example of a project carried out by a task force bringing together different people from volcanology, geology, geophysics, but also social scientists led by uh, uh, Tibaldi, but also with co-leadership from Don Dingwall, who happens to be in this, uh, in this room. Again, you can see from the uh, type of publications that it covers a lot of ground and the interface with global change, but also, of course, the, uh, the interface with landforms and, uh, and natural hazards. This group is also organizing a lot of training courses for young researchers, so the money given by IOP is seed money, and it has allowed them to attract major funding from the European Union for the Erasmus training uh, program. Again, major involvement of young people, but also a lot of uh, dissemination and outreach like uh, shown by this stand, this live demonstration at the uh, last EGU meeting in, uh, in Vienna. Another example of a task force is the group on sedimentary basins, where we have also a lot of industry involvement from the geoenergy industry, both from the uh, uh, fossil fuel side, but also increasingly more from the uh, geothermal exploration side, which is a very important topic today in the research programs funded by the European uh, Commission. Let me give you an example of the type of uh, approaches. Of course, seismics is very important, uh, use well data is very important, but integrated modeling is equally uh, important. And again, what we see here is a direct transfer of knowledge built up in the uh, fossil fuel world to the uh, world of geothermal energy exploration. And this is part of, let's say, the major effort being made in the context of the energy transition. A, an example of, the, uh, of a regional coordinating committee, Topo Europe, born in the ILP with uh, strong support of the uh, European Academy of Sciences. Uh, here you see some uh, tomographic cross-section, still a depth of 600 kilometer for the upper mantle in the Europe. You see in blue the downgoing slabs going down under the Carpathians, the Gibraltar Arc, the Calabrian Arc, and the Crete. But you see overlying it, you see a lot of red. And this stands for the areas where we have a uh, reduction in the uh, seismic velocities, in most cases uh, equivalent to a uh, elevated temperature. And what you can see, basically, all over Western and Central Europe, we have a pretty hot upper mantle, which is good news for the uh, geothermal energy exploration, which is directly connected to this, uh, to this program. This program started, basically, as a platform and pretty soon got major funding from 23 member states in, uh, in Europe, providing enough funding to keep 60 young researchers off the street. And... Uh, Basically, what you see here is the timetable of uh, the uh, design of such a project. It starts, of course, with workshops. Then we got major funding for Topo Europe. Then we got a big national program 
uh, funded in Spain, Top Iberia. Uh, might be interesting to uh, tell you here that the average elevation of Iberia is, is higher than the average elevation of, uh, of Switzerland. It's an intraplate tectonic setting. Uh, it has always been an enigma, and it gave exactly the argument to the Spanish research community to get 8 million euro for an integrated project covering the whole of Spain with uh, seismic instrumentation, doing a lot of seismics, and also doing a lot of modeling. Subsequently, we got funding from the European Commission for training networks, and we uh, gave a lot of the scientific rationale for getting the European plate observing system of the ground, which is a major program for scientific research infrastructure for the solid earth in, uh, in Europe. So you see a significant multiplier of, uh, let's say, a very modest contribution in terms of money from ILP, but you saw that it made the difference to bring these people together. This is an example of a training network funded by the European Commission on the topographic expression of subduction zones. We have a lot of them in, uh, in the European uh, setting. We have all type of uh, very interesting trenchant behavior, in many cases a little bit different from the standard models. And this has very pronounced topographic expressions, which is important, of course, also as a challenge for the modeling community, not only for numerical modeling, but also for experimental tectonic uh, modeling. And you can see this uh, network basically funding uh, 15 young uh, researchers, but also strong industry uh, participation. And uh, again, uh, is one of the examples where with the IOP seed money, we, uh, we could scale things up. This is the uh, and another example, let's say, of strong added value in the solid earth sciences recently initiated in the, uh, in the European setting. EPOS, European Plate Observing System, integrating for more than 500 million euro solid earth research infrastructure from volcanic observatories till seismic uh, stations, till GPS, but also experimental modeling uh, facilities. And uh, this is a major success for the solid earth community because this is for the first time that the solid earth is really in the same league as some of the other MIGO sciences fields in, uh, in Europe, including uh, astrophysics, but also uh, fields like solar energy. So this is very much an integration of what is there available on a national scale, but bring it together, taking again Europe as a natural laboratory model it, study it, not only for better understanding of what's going on in the earth, but also very much for societal challenges like natural hazards, but also in terms of uh, our coastlines and uh, our unstable uh, topographies in coastal areas and in mountain uh, belts. A few words about ILP activities uh, in 2018 and, uh, and beyond. As I mentioned to you before, it's a global program. So we were very happy with, a, with the very strong activity by our Chinese uh, colleagues. We uh, participated uh, and sponsored uh, a conference on resources for future generations in Vancouver. Of course, we were very happy to uh, play an active role also as part of the IUGS and IUGG meetings in respectively Beijing and Montreal. And we are participating in the opening of the DDE data center Conchian in, uh, in China and sponsor a lot of other international meetings, including meetings of the young uh, earth scientists. So for us, partnership is really in the DNA of, uh, of ILP, uh, because for us the I is not only standing for international, but also for inspirational uh, activities. And that is basically cross-fertilization between the different tribes in our field, but also, of course, interfacing with other parts of uh, the earth system. So a few words about the roadmap. We will continue to activate the research councils because we finance networking, but the research itself, of course, has to be financed by others, including research councils, but also the European Commission and other major funding agencies. We will continue with promoting strong presence at international meetings. We will continue with a very active publication uh, policy. We will further strengthen the link with, uh, with industry. That's, after all, uh, a place where a lot of the people who do PSD projects will go after PSD, and we will further explore opportunities 
for further cooperation in integrated soil earth sciences for mutual benefit. And also in that context, uh, I'm very happy uh, to, uh, that IOP was invited to be here today with uh, your celebration. Again, promotion and involvement of young researchers is for us key. And of course, we are mentally preparing for our happy birthday next year. We are only 40, so we are not in a midlife crisis. We are really preparing for the next phase. But we also know that we will not be alone at that uh, celebration. And, and again, let me extend a warm congratulation to IUGG for this uh, first centennial. We count on you also for your second centennial, and we are very happy to be with you in the, uh, the rest of your life, and we count on you also for continuing support and inspiration. I'd like to leave it here. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much for that. Um, you've done an excellent job keeping well within the time envelope. Uh, I'd like to uh, introduce our next speaker. It's Kurt Lambeck, who's an Emeritus Professor at the Australian National University in Canberra and a former President of the Australian Academy of Sciences. And he'll be speaking on the topic, the Earth from space. Thank you, Chris. It's obviously an impossible topic to talk about in 20 minutes. Earth from space. Uh, so I'm going to have to cut a few corners and if your favorite picture or your favorite subject doesn't appear, I will apologize for that up front. Now, it's of course redu redundant to say that geophysics has changed enormously in the last hundred years. And it's also really unnecessary in this community to, to say that the IUGG has played an important role in this through its facilitation of scientific discussions and data exchanges, particularly across international boundaries. Without a doubt, much of this change has occurred in the latter part of this century, thanks to the unleashing of the new technologies, of which the ability to observe the Earth from space is a very important part. The iconic picture that you see here uh, of the Earth, one of the earliest pictures of the Earth as, uh, as a whole, in a sense shows it all why geophysics has changed. It shows the globality of the planet. It's uh, resulted in a shift in thinking, I believe, from regional geophysics to more global problems. It illustrates the fluidity of the planet, the hydrosphere, uh, atmosphere, and the interactions between the fluid layers and the solid earth itself. But it also illustrates the loneliness of the planet in space and it's positioned the earth right into the whole history of the solar system. Now, if we want to try and go through the uh, changes that have occurred from the beginning, we need to start somewhere with a benchmark and the one that I've, sorry, what's the process for changing the slides? Oh, oh okay, sorry, yeah. Uh, the, the benchmark that I have taken, I hope that's reasonably readable, is a book, the, this is actually uh, the first edition of Harold Jeffries, The Earth, uh, in which he set out the essential problems that geophysics was uh, coping with a hundred years ago. And if you can read that, you will recognize that a lot of the themes are still very much with us today, except that we now have a much better observational basis for discussing these issues and better theoretical capabilities. Uh, I, as I said a moment ago, I cannot cover all those areas uh, and I will just touch on two only areas that I have been sort of on the fringes or on the margins of for the last, since the beginning of this uh, observing the Earth and that is the Earth's gravity field and uh, uh, other issues related to the shape 
of the Earth. You'll notice, incidentally, that the one problem that does not appear there is the discussion of continental drift. Harold Jeffries, till the very end of his life, uh, totally resisted that idea. The shape of the Earth, and we talk here about the geoid, which is sort of an idealized form, if you like, of the Earth, if it were, if it were totally water covered, tells us something about the internal density of the Earth. At the time, a hundred years ago, all that was really known about the shape of the Earth what it, was that it was ellipsoidal and the shape of a fluid rotating. And it was generally believed that what you had here was the shape of the original Earth once it became solidified with small irregularities on the surface from the topography and from its isostatic uh, compensation. And that really persisted then for the next um, sort of 50 years or so. And just at the start of the first satellites, the first recognition that the Earth may be a little bit more complex in its shape uh, came uh, up. And this is the result from surface data measurements in about 1959, uh, 57 here, the shape of the Earth in the pre-satellite days. And anybody who's worked with satellite gravity fields will recognize some of these features already. The interesting thing about this was that what it led to was three very different interpretations. And that really, those interpretations really ruled the discussion for almost a subsequent decade. One was that this reflected conditions at the time of the formation of the Earth, or at least the solidification of the Earth, and hence it gave uh, a picture of the Earth in its very early period. The other one, the more was a dynamic one, that this was the result of processes within the mantle, in other words, mantle convection, a concept that at that time was largely downplayed by the geophysics community, but supported by the geological uh, community, uh, particularly by people like Wegener initially, of course, but then Alf um, Holmes and others as well. And the third interpretation was the dogmatic one. The Earth is in hydrostatic equilibrium, therefore it's all a load of nonsense. And I do recall arguments like that going on into the mid-60s. Fortunately, with um, the improvement of the satellite tracking abilities, we um, we were able to analyze the perturbations in the orbits to, with increasingly higher accuracies, and from that we were able to infer the uh, gravity field. And this particular solution, 1961, was one the first ones that really showed up patterns that began to resemble. Uh, the then uh, plate that be uh, be began to be consistent with the then emerging concepts of plate tectonics and mantle convective processes. And I think from here on, the community generally accepted the fact that the gravity field was an important reflection on deep mantle processes. And this was important because this the recognition because it led to increasing effort being put into this area. What made it possible to make that progress was essentially the improved tracking accuracies of satellites. Initially, the very early uh, data, I recall, were of the order 100 meter precisions, which tr translates into positional location determination of similar orders, and it would take you a long time to get there. But by the, 19, uh, the end of the 1960s, uh, it was down to about a meter type accuracies thanks to the introduction of laser technology and the good quality camera tracking and as well as the Doppler systems uh, resulting in the ability to uh, position oneself on the earth at the meter type level. The only trouble was it took you six months of data collection to get to that level of course so it wasn't a, a real time operation. So where we stood, say, 50 years ago, uh, was one, 
where we had tantalizing results for the gravity field with an anticipation that if you could track the satellites more accurately, accurately if, you, if you could get higher resolution, uh, then we would be able to learn much more about the deep convective process. The other point that we'd reached by then was a predictive capability of satellite motion in the near Earth environments at a level of accuracy where this became very significant for other Earth monitoring um, activities. For look, uh, we were beginning to see the time dependence in the gravity field and we were beginning to speculate about what the uh, fluid part of the Earth was doing to our satellite orbits. The other contribution at that point was the emerging improvements in the Earth's rotation, something that turns out to be very important for space navigation, particularly deep planetary space uh, navigation, etc., as well as timekeeping. And the other thing that one became aware of was the possibility of uh, real-time positioning capabilities, at least real-time, in that case meaning within a short period of time. And there was a growing confidence that we would be able to do that in the, um, you know, in the, in the forthcoming years with improved uh, methodologies. And together these things led to the recognition, at least by the geodetic community, that they had to abandon their largely static concept of the Earth, a body had a shape and a state like that unless it was uh, perturbed by locally but into a body that was constantly uh, subjected to forces, to uh, being stressed and deforming accordingly, and that there was a real role for uh, the geodetic measurements in trying to understand this uh, process. An important milestone was at the end of the 60s in a document, and I hope you can read this, that came out at the end of the 60s, uh, commonly referred to as the terrestrial, uh, the Williamstown document, where a group of people sat down and really mapped out what they thought was going to be the future of the whole satellite observing program as applied to the solid earth and fluid uh, geophysics. And these Technologies that were identified then, I'll just go down some of the ones, the, the, the very long baseline radio interferometry was then at its infancy, thanks to the radio astronomers, satellite altimetry, there had been a prototype satellite that had gone up GOC that demonstrated the capabilities, drag free satellite technologies were being talked about to reduce the air drag and solar radiation pressure effects. Um, Diff better ways of moving, uh, improving the gravity field measurements using the drag, uh, using satellite to satellite tracking methods and uh, uh, radio, uh, uh, gradiometry uh, measurements. And then uh, there were also the early discussions, at least by the civilian community, of the global positioning systems. The, uh, GPS system was being beginning to be talked about, but also the French systems were also being developed at that time. And these things, all these technologies actually came to pass. At the time, we thought it would take us 10 years, that we would see all this in effect in orbit, etc. 10 years' time. It took 40 years to get there, but the, uh, the benefit was that the accuracies that were obtained then were orders of magnitude in anything we could have envisaged uh, at the time. I'll just show a few results quickly. I hope that some of these work. Uh, these are some of the new satellites that are up today uh, that essentially use that, uh, these methodologies that were developed quite a long time ago, but now actually putting it into effect. The global navigation satellite systems, not just the GPS, but the Galileo system, <clears throat> and also the various uh, national uh, systems being developed, I think will result in real rapid, very high precision um, positioning. Uh, the gravity missions, in that case, the, uh, uh, the GRACE missions, the GRACE-1, which had a very 
successful, long-lived life, but unfortunately, well, I, I don't know what the status of Grace uh, follow-on at the moment is. Last I heard, it was still suffering to some degree, uh, but hopefully it can hang in there. And it stresses one of the important messages that we have to uh, give time and time again the importance of the continuity, not only in the development of the technology, but in keeping these things flying and the data being analyzed. And then the satellite altimetry, uh, one of the great success stories of the past uh, couple of decades. Um, so into the 70s, into the 80s, and up to today, that spectrum there of the accuracy of measurements, the vertical axis as a, uh, through time, we see it forever uh, decreasing to the point where millimeter accuracy is now being obtained for special geodetic uh, uses. But the other important thing is that the time scale in which this can, these accuracies can be pr uh, produced has been reduced very much from years of integration of data to weeks down to 24 hours now today. So we, uh, we're getting there. One of the early results that I think was important was from the radio astronomy uh, experiments with the long baseline interferometry. And this is the baseline of a series of measurements over a 10 year period uh, between uh, the US and Germany. And what you essentially see is a function of time, the separation between the, cha uh, baseline, uh, between the sites changing at a rate of about 1.8 millimeters per year. And if you put an error bar on that, you'd probably find something like plus or minus 0.2. In other words, we, they were able to measure that spreading rate across the Atlantic uh, with a very high precision um, which really put the kibosh, if you like, on the concept of uh, plate tectonics being a load of nonsense. I mean, this really demonstrated it. Interesting, I put down the numbers from earlier experiments to try and measure the spreading between Greenland and uh, Europe in the case of uh, Wegener's measurements uh, using uh, observations from the 1820s to 1900s. He obtained something like 32 meters uh, per year spreading. Accuracy has improved, and the next time he tried it, it was down to 20 meters. And if you can actually look at these numbers through time, and each time, as measuring accuracies uh, improved, the rates, of course, came tumbling down. I don't think we're going to see that in this case with the, uh, the spreading rates here. The most convincing evidence to put to shame any doubter of, uh, of uh, plate tectonics would be from the uh, GPS surveys of recent years, where we're seeing vectors here of the horizontal displacements of the order of centimeters uh, per year around the globe. And very consistent with the results coming out from the paleomagnetism, which were the integrated movements over periods of uh, tens of millions of years. And it always strikes me as remarkable that these instantaneous measurements are almost the same as the long-term averages. It was recognized then that the plate tectonics hypothesis was intrinsically substantiated. Uh, rigid plates moving, uh, essentially rigid in the first approximation moving around with rather complex movements at the, uh, at the plate boundaries. And the challenge was to try and understand what happens at the plate boundaries. This is the example from the uh, Tohoku earthquake, and it's coming, you can see it now, about a few minutes after the red star appeared, uh, Japan started to move, and you can see it growing. You can see the movements growing. The, vert the blue part are the vertical movements uh, that follow it, uh, the blue and the red coloring. And that's the sort of thing that you can now do with dense GPS networks. The challenge, of course, is, is to try and do this in near real time. This particular result only came out some years after the earthquake actually occurred. It helps you understand 
uh, the four plates, uh, the, the movements, but it's not going to help you in any predictive uh, capacity. If you look very carefully, if you could, see, could have seen it, you'd see little movements before the actual main waves hit uh, Japan, but they're so small, they are uh, essentially buried in the noise. And I think we can expect to see much more of this sort of thing and a much more un uh, much improved understanding of the kin uh, kinematics of the plate motions and of the crustal deformation. Another example here, could you start this one? This is satellite altimetry, initially, dis initially set up to look at um, the shape of the Earth itself, but very quickly recognized as uh, being of oceanographic importance. And we see the spatial variation on the one side, but we also see the progressive uh, uh, rise of global uh, change in mean sea level but through time. I can't go into details. Next one, please. I'll just do. And the most recent cab of the rank is from the, could you go to the next one, please? Uh, okay, uh, yeah. Uh, this is just a reminder that the gravity field improvements we're using the, uh, um, okay, uh, from the satellite to so satellite, sorry, satellite to satellite to grace mission results. This is a recent solution by Paul Tregoni. And essentially what you see here, uh, the redistribution of surface mass on the 10 day interval uh, patterns here. And what this particular picture shows us is that we are able to get very high resolution information on the gravity field in very short time periods and that is fluctuating rapidly in association with hydrological signals as in the Amazon, for example. Um, you can see the monsoon patterns, if you can see it a bit more clearly over Australia, etc. So that we have a real tool now for monitoring the mass displacements that are associated with uh, rainfall events, groundwater, etc. And I think we're going to see very much more of this, and as I said before, the challenge is going to be uh, to keep these missions up in the air. An area I haven't talked about, but I think is extremely important and it's going to be of increasing importance is the INSAR technology for looking at uh, regional deformations of the solid Earth, but also with different frequencies to monitor the entire Earth's surface free of cloud cover. So where do we stand today? Chris is getting restless here, so I'm not going to tell us where we stand today. But I'll, I will leave a couple of challenges, I think, for the IUDG. I can't ref, uh, refrain from that. Uh, one is to play an increasing role in ensuring that these missions, and most of them, I haven't been able to emphasize that enough, are multinational missions to facilitate that as much as possible. And the other one is that as we are looking more and more at the surface phenomena, the geophysics itself, emphasis are changing away from the classical divisions into uh, multidisciplinary or the convergence as Marcia talked about um, uh, before lunch issues. And from my own experience, one of the things we have to do, even, one, if, even if one does it reluctantly as a physical scientist, one has to bring the social science community into the debate. And that's, that's going to be a real challenge, I think, that the RUDG is faced with. And just my final comment is, the reason I emphasize that point is, there's a growing tendency for subjects like Earth system science, whatever that may mean, to be taken over by the non-scientists. And I think the RUDG has to be very careful about keeping an eye on this to make sure that evidence-based science remains central to all of these discussions. So I think that's my take-home message. Thank you, Kurt, and uh, it, it's a certainly an enormous topic, which uh, we, of course, could have been, uh, could have had many more hours speaking on. But may I please uh, invite Vladimir, Vladimir Rybinin, to speak on ocean science for sustainable development. So, um, you have the floor. Yes, this one. 
Good afternoon, everyone. You know, I know that I was supposed to receive a plaque from IUGG, but I uh, then suggest that you will judge yourself if we deserve or not. So uh, the thing is that, uh, indeed, this is the planet ocean. That is also uh, was, I think, demonstrated by, uh, by, uh, my, by the previous speaker, Kurt, because, you know, when this is only from the space, we can understand that it is actually this is the image taken from the point in which the area of the ocean is the maximum it covers the whole the whole circle so you know uh, despite i'm supposed to speak about climb uh, ocean i need to start uh, with this fantastic image very very hard evidence that the emissions of carbon continue to grow and the year 2018 was the year of the highest emissions ever it means that ocean is in danger even more, and we have to really change the, uh, the paradigm. So in, in ocean science, we speak about consequences of climate and, you know, and the really, uh, climate change and the really grave. So if you look at this graph, you will see that uh, ocean consumes a lot of uh, heat. Uh, the average estimate is 93% of the total excess heat generated by the greenhouse gas effect ended up in the ocean. But you know, I heard many ambassadors that were very happy to stay so, but what they don't understand is how this figure was created. It was created because of the ocean science, because of the Argo floats, because of the an an analysis of information, analysis of the heat flux, and only after that, after this uh, very intensive and very delicate work that is impossible to make from the space because ocean uh, is not transparent for radio waves, you can just come to this element. And then, of course, ocean consumes carbon, around, uh, say, 28%. Also, this is an average estimate. And then what happens is the carbon gets absorbed, ocean gets more acidic, and this creates huge problems for, lives, uh, for life in the ocean, uh, particularly for those uh, forms of life that require uh, some uh, carbon and some energy to generate shells. So this also, uh, as, uh, absorption of heat creates mean sea level rise that was also presented to you by Kurt in the, in the last talk. And this mean sea level rise is a little bit accelerating. Um, but what is also worrying that this sea level rise is uh, quite uniform. In the last presentation, uh, you saw a movie, and this is an average of uh, the mean sea level rise of, uh, I don't remember exactly, I think like 15, uh, it's like uh, 25 years. You will see strong anomaly in the western part of the Pacific. That is related to the changes uh, in atmospheric circulation and also to, actually we have in the room the uh, chairperson of the Joint Scientific Committee for the World Climate Search Program, Detlef Stammer, who is uh, working on the subject. But what is also important, because sea level rise is the fastest in this part of the world, we also need to remember that the tropical cyclones are also the strongest in this part of the world. And also the people go into this part of the world because more and more population lives there. And there is also, of course, natural growth of population. So this creates a synergistic effect. We really need to address this. And then coming back to the story of, uh, of space, you know, uh, because groundwater extraction, uh, the sometimes the local subsidence is far exceeding the, the rate of, of sea level change. So that's what is happening. But on top of this, in the ocean, we have uh, a new problem. I don't know if you see this well, but there are more than 600 dead zones in the ocean. Uh, zones, excuse me, zones, not really dead zones, but zones of um, uh, depletion of the, uh, of the oxygen that are related also to, to the climate change. And we have uh, the very well-known uh, problem of plastic. Plastic actually is uh, quite visible, but what is happening that we don't know what is going to happen uh, to plastic in the, in, the, in the long run. So one of the definitions of the Anthropocene is uh, that there is a layer of plastic at the bottom of the ocean. So it has already geological implications. But the science of plastic still needs to be developed. So, and then, of course, we have uh, in, uh, the criminal ways of fisheries in the ocean that are basically depleting life, life there. So we have multiple stresses affecting the ocean in addition to climate change, but the climate change is definitely one of the strongest and one of the gravest enemies of the ocean health. So ocean is also developing as in, terms, uh, in terms of economy. Uh, the ocean economy, if we measure that the money that is generated in the ocean in the average 
is uh, several trillion US dollars. There are several estimates. This is from the World Wild Fund. For OECD and Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development is also speaking about similar scale of numbers. This is about the economy UK or Brazil. So this is very big, big money. But you know, so some, let's say it's three trillion US dollars. So um, the absorbing system in the ocean roughly costs one billion US dollars. So it's 3,000 times less than the money is generated in the ocean. And what uh, my organization, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, is able to put into coordination of observations is around uh, 300,000 US dollars. Again, 3,000 times less. So we underobserve the ocean and we undercoordinate what we observe in the ocean. That's a big dilemma. So, and this also is manifested uh, in, in how um, money goes into support of ocean science. This is an assessment of philanthropic support to sustainable development goals. There are 17 sustainable development goals, as you know. So, uh, ocean gets roughly than, uh, roughly slightly less than half of a percent. Uh, all the money basically goes to health and, uh, and also goes to uh, education, which is very important. What is, there is only one uh, sustainable development goal that is, which is less supported, and this is Sustainable Development Goal 17 on partnership. And this is supposed to be that Sustainable Development Goal that will trigger action on, on, on Agenda 2030. So we really need to change that paradigm. We need to be very convincing in how we uh, generate uh, support for our science. But also this has implications in how we can fund ocean observations coming to the same topic. In comparison with meteorological observations in which everything is more or less rosy, so no problems foreseen in, uh, for the future for more than two-thirds of different types of meteorological observations. In the ocean, more than 50% of observations do not have sustainability, do not have the uh, guaranteed future. So this again shows that we need to really convince the governmental uh, power system or convince decision-making system that this is important. And this is really existentially important to have an observing system in the ocean. So, you know, but we have a lot of conventions in the United Nations system that uh, have implications for the ocean. We have Sustainable Development Goal 14, which is uh, one of the 17 uh, goals of uh, Agenda 2030. We have Convention of the Law of the Sea, and what is very important, for the first time in history, there is now a conference that is discussing international legal binding instrument on conservation, sustainable use of marine biodiversity beyond areas of natural jurisdiction. A very long title, but basically, if you summarize it, it's about life in the ocean, for in the common part of the ocean, in the depths of the ocean. And because uh, this is now becoming a requirement, a legally binding requirement, we hope very much that ocean science will also be differently uh, uh, based now, because now it is a uh, science that is based on curiosity. It is decided by research agencies what you do in ocean science. Now, because we have legal obligation to protect life in the ocean, we hope very much that support to observations and, on, and ocean research will become more mandatory. There are some other different frameworks, but you know, um, so far they all are aspirational. But uh, to make it into a real obligation of member states to contribute to science in the ocean is now very important for protecting life and protecting our future. So on top of that, if we look uh, how ocean science capacity is distributed around the world, and recently IUC and the Environmental Oceanographic Commission conducted an, anal an analysis of this for uh, a subset of countries. So this was published in the Global Ocean Science Report. So this is the map of the world according to the capacity of uh, ocean science in different countries. You will have, you will see three centers of power. This is North America, this is Europe, and Western uh, Asia plus Australia. But you know, you don't see on the map Africa. You know, my own country unfortunately sh uh, shrunk uh, to, to the strip uh, uh, facing the, the, uh, the, the Arctic Ocean. So, but you know, the, uh, the situation in Africa and some also small island development states is very dramatic. So these countries are not also unable to generate science. They're unfortunately unable to benefit from advances in ocean science. But ocean science is important because even landlocked countries uh, depend on what is happening in the ocean. So that's what needs to be changed. 
So, you know, instead of uh, presenting to you different examples of what is uh, developing faster, what are the recent advances, I would like to present to you a more or less holistic view on the capacity of ocean science. So we are more or less good when it comes to diagnostics of the problem. I told you that the ocean uh, is getting warmer because of acidification, but we are not yet able to provide uh, uh, reliable solutions to this. We need to go into that space. In terms of observations, we are good when it comes to, relatively good when it comes to uh, thermodynamics of, of, uh, and uh, dynamics of, of the ocean. But when it comes to uh, biogeochemistry, biology, ecology, we are lagging behind. The same is true for still polar oceans. Uh, despite the international polar year, we need to have uh, also to cover the gap. We also are quite weak when it comes to uh, deep ocean observations. We do not know about, uh, a lot about how ocean ecosystems function, even composition of many ocean ecosystems um, is, uh, is poorly known, particularly for bottom ecosystem and some other ecosystems. And what is really important that we need to observe this and create a database that will be opening information for analysis uh, that will be accumulated and knowledge will come from that analysis. So we need, first of all, to de develop uh, that database that, and this requires change in, in the data policies and data practices. So uh, this also, the lack of knowledge about ocean creates uh, society and decision-making uh, approaches that are not so really active and we, according to the World Ocean Assessment, are running out of time uh, for starting to sustainably manage the ocean. Funding base, I already spoke about this, and how to overcome this, we need to really create a clear value chain and present value chain uh, uh, to decision-making system. And of course, uneven capacity. Everyone has to be on the same boat. Right? So this creates a social contract for ocean science. You know, after the conference of parties of United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change at Copenhagen in 2008, when no decisions were taken, despite all the science was already there, um, climate scientists started to, to think about how to make the, the, the whole science actionable. Now the same turn came to the ocean science. And we really need to create the social contract and try to make the science more more active and more convincing. So there is an action because there is a sense of urgency. So, and also what is important, the ocean science is now becoming an end-to-end -end science. We start with observations. This is all is about research. These observations generate data and knowledge and they generate information. On the basis of the observations and knowledge and technologies, we generate certain services, for example, tsunami. And this is where IUGE comes uh, as a strong uh, contributor to us. But it also what is happening is the ocean space is now managed like the space is managed in, in cities. Uh, like you have code of the road everywhere, this space now is getting managed in such a way there is a coastal zone management, there is maritime special planning for exclusive economic zone, there are marine protected areas, areas of, of biological significance. So ocean is now being managed, which requires a new level of science. This requires also capacity development. This requires focus on ocean literacy, so people know how they depend on the ocean. And this was the main motivation for the IUC of UNESCO to come up with an idea to conduct a decade of ocean science for sustainable development. The most selling phrase was the ocean we need for the future we want. But now the decade has been, uh, decla decade has been proclaimed. It is starting on the 1st of January 2021. We are working very hard on the implementation plan of the decade. It's very important that you all know about the decade and contribute. Just go to the decade website, just Google it, and you will be able to see where we are. Now we speak about the ocean science we need for the ocean we want. This will be the implementation plan. This is the logo of the decade which basically shows that ocean is kind of spiraling and, uh, and moving forward uh, the logos of sustainable development. And this is how we would like to approach the subject. We would like to complete certain, uh, to, to cover certain gaps, uh, develop the capacity and uh, try to solve some science problems in the ocean. That would be, first of all, the complete uh, map of the ocean depths and make it more general, uh, the first atlas of the ocean, then complete the observing system, uh, really make a step forward in knowledge of ecosystem, that would be quantitative, 
this requires a portal of ocean data. All of it requires a portal of ocean for data. And to really systematically address the hazards that come from the ocean, this is possible through multi-hazard early warning systems. So we cannot do this uh, in isolation from other earth sciences. There has to be um, a, an ocean model has to be part of the earth system model. Ocean decision making is dependent on economy, so this requires earth system science. And of course, we speak about capacity development. And communication of those advances will be able to trigger interest and pick up in many societal applications, like coastal zone management, maritime spatial planning, adaptation mitigation of climate change. That's the approach that we are, we, we are trying, but the most important thing is how we upscale the initiative, which will be likely the largest environmental campaign in the history of science. So we hope very much that we will engage everyone in this domain. And I would like on, only to present to you two uh, of the areas of research and development that are priority from the, from the seven areas. But maybe there will be more areas. Priority area one, comprehensive map. This is a picture of the zone where the Malaysian Boeing was being sought by the uh, by submarine, by uh, underwater vehicle, because there was uh, understanding that uh, the uh, remains are in, in this particular uh, area. So they came with the submarine to this area. Um, uh, the submarine was able to reach the depths of 4,000 meters, and they only discovered that the depths in this particular place is 6,000 meters. This is how we know the depths of the ocean. So then this is uh, the the uh, IUC run tsunami warning system. So uh, it is uh, very hard work for IUC uh, to, uh, to coordinate uh, mechanisms to, to issue warnings. And Kurt Lamerck already spoke about it, and, uh, and it was also in the lit lithosphere discussion, uh, how, uh, how tsunamis are generated by, by the, the tectonic movements. But last year was a very difficult year for us because there were two uh, tsunamis in Indonesia related to uh, a, a land, uh, an underwater landslide and then to collapse a volcano, Anak Krakatau, and we are not able to cover such, such disasters. So we really need to embrace more sources of tsunami. This is also a task for IUGG, I think, very, very strongly. So this is my last slide. So we're very excited about the perspectives. Because I think uh, we can uh, have some very interesting and exciting work. For example, uh, complete the map of the ocean, uh, complete uh, uh, the observing system for the ocean. First of all, uh, first of, uh, the first, uh, uh, for the first time in history, create a really sustainable observing system in the polar oceans. But for the first time also in history, this is a little bit outside the IUGG remit, remit we will be able to cover and observe whole life in the ocean through the use of molecular techniques, environmental DNA sampling. For the first time in history, uh, can we imagine genetic image of the whole ocean? Not that we are going to take it into other space, other planet, but we would like to keep this planet alive when it comes to the ocean, and the image is very important for this. We have databases, we have now approaches, and having this image, having climate predictions, we will be able to predict the future of ocean life. It is also e equally exciting and very important. So, and we have, if we have the complete picture and much better understanding uh, of how ocean life and ocean ecosystems function, it may be possible to use several uh, approaches, including selective breeding, and try to expose uh, ecosystems of coral reefs to the new conditions that we can predict. And with that, we will be able to breed those species and th uh, that are more uh, sustainable for the future. So I think the ocean science is changing its face. You know, it remains fundamental science, academic science, but also it's now more and more embarking on helping the society, and that's exactly the, the topic of my presentation. Now, please decide if we deserve the plaque or not. Thank you. <laughs> I think we all agree that after that presentation, Vladimir and the IOC do deserve their plaque, and you'll be getting it in a little while. Uh, our next presenter, continuing a theme which is close to our hearts, which is water and life, being presented by Alberto Montanari. Yes, there you are. Thank you very much.
Thank you. I really would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's an honor for me to represent the European Geosciences Union today. I think this is, uh, of course, a very important day, 100 years of history of Earth, uh, planetary and space sciences provide an incentive uh, to look forward, to elaborate a vision. Today I'm speaking about water, which is my field of research, and the title may look naive, uh, because of course we all know that water is essential for life. I would like to briefly elaborate some considerations to prove uh, that the relationship between water, humans, and society will become even more critical in the future. So we indeed need to elaborate a vision, to take action. The first consideration is related to climate change. Of course, that we know that climate change is an issue. What I would like to say is that water is the interface between climate change and humans. Most of the impacts of climate change take place through water through the filtering operated by hydrology, operated by the catchment. And therefore, it's extremely important that in elaborating our future vision for water, we take into account climate change in a manner that is, uh, that is appropriate to support adaptation and mitigation. The second consideration is related to the water demands. They are increasing, as we all know, not only for increasing population, the demands are increasing also for increasing the quality of life. Uh, even where population is not increasing, we have an increasing demand for water. And therefore we see that there is the combination of two situations that uh, are inducing a, indeed a critical situation, as we know. The third consideration is related to hydropower and renewable energy. We all know that it's extremely important for us to move towards a sustainable energy production and uh, in uh, renewable energies, ground uh, sorry, hydropower is going to play an essential, even more essential role in the future because uh, with improving technologies we can uh, profit from small jumps uh, and also hydropower gives the way to store energy by repumping water when uh, the demand of energy is, uh, is low. And uh, another consideration is related to water for food. And uh, here on the right, you see a movie that shows uh, the progress of uh, irrigation water demands in Asia, which turns uh, into a depleting storage of groundwater. This is another situation that is evolving uh, in a critical manner. And therefore, again, we need to elaborate a vision, a vision that for sure it's possible, provided we support with good science uh, a good operation of politics and policy. So what are the key essential elements of this vision? First of all, first of all let's, uh, let's uh, assume that uh, water is no more a local problem. In the past, we were used to consider water problems as a local issue. Now it's becoming a global problem. And if we look at the Global Risk 2015 report of the World Economic Forum, global water crises are the biggest threat facing the planet over the next decade. For the first time, water is at the top position for impact. And uh, also, two-thirds of the global population live under condition of severe water scarcity for at least one month per, uh, during the year. And half of the world's largest cities experience water scarcity. And if we look at the connection between global risks, uh, we see that water is connected to several other risks, uh, including migrations, including terrorism. So, first of all, Given that it's a global problem, we need to turn into a global approach. We need to model and plan water resources management with a global approach. And this is now possible because water transfer today is something that is easier than in the past through the virtual water trade, through water transfers that can benefit from improving technologies, 
we can move towards a global water resources management, which is, of course, not easy. We need a better connection with policymakers. We need a better connection with our colleagues, uh, science colleagues, uh, and uh, we need a more interdisciplinary approach. And the second, uh, today I would like to stress and to focus on uh, the opportunity given by new technologies, and in particular, satellite observations. We now have the means to collect uh, a lot of data at the global level. So this magic word, uh, big data, is providing exciting opportunities that we are not profiting from completely today. So we need to move forward towards global modeling by using uh, this global information in the most efficient way. And I would like to give an example, which is really interesting in my opinion, and it's the Google Global Flood Forecasting Project. This is a project that is using data collected by mobile phones uh, in order to elaborate information to the citizens. Of course, we know what are the limits of this kind of information, but nevertheless, I, uh, I think it is uh, really exciting. You can see here a comparison between a flood simulation generated on the left from public available data and uh, the same flood simulation on the right generated through data collected uh, with the mobile phones. And uh, this kind of uh, new data is really providing, as I said, new perspective together with satellites data. I would like to show an example of application which uh, I think it is interesting to show what is the potential of this new information. And this example is related to the use of night lights. Uh, and I would like to take the opportunity to present some recent work uh, we developed with my research group. And they were presented in papers published in the AGU journals, Geophysical Research Letter and Water Resources Research. Basically, we use these data, which uh, are expressed in the form of a time series uh, from uh, uh, 1992 to today. And in this research, we stopped uh, our data analysis to 2013. And uh, in particular, we focused on the analysis of the progress of night lights along the river network at the global level. Keep in mind that the spatial resolution of these data is quite fine. It's nearly one kilometer at the equator, and they cover almost all the globe. What we did is, first of all, to analyze the correlation between night light along the river network and damages inf induced by floods. And we found a very good correlation. So indeed, night lights are a proxy for exposure exposure of society to, in this case, floods, because we are working uh, along the river network. And uh, the fact that they are a good proxy means uh, that uh, they provide a new opportunity to study the progress of exposure in time, starting from 1992. And the application that I want to present today is uh, uh, dedicated to, is focusing on uh, water resources management, and in particular, the idea is uh, to uh, elaborate uh, an estimate of water stress. What we do is uh, to define an index, uh, which is given by the ratio between cumulative night lights along the major river network, uh, divided by the mean annual flow along uh, the river network. So we estimate the ratio between night light and river flow. We use night light as a proxy for demand, water demand. Night light is a proxy for population, and therefore we use it as a proxy for demand. And we use the river flow, average yearly flow, as a proxy for water resources availability. And we study this index this ratio that I just introduced, and also we study the derivative of this index to check whether the pressure on water resources has increased more. We made a check of the input data. On the uh, left graphs, uh, you see on the top the average night light during the 20-year observation period. In the middle graph, uh, you see the night light accumulated along the river network, and you see the traces of the rivers there. And uh, in the bottom graph, uh, you see the mean annual discharge. And we made uh, some checks uh, 
to estimate the reliability of the mean annual discharge with observed data. And all of these input data were derived by global databases with, which were checked at selected locations. And here you can see the distribution of the pressure on water resources. What you can see from this graph is that indeed it's something that we already know in Europe, in, uh, in, in the Central America, sorry, in the United States uh, and in uh, parts of Asia, we have the highest pressure on water resources. But what is interesting, I, I think, is to look at the derivative where the pressure has increased more. And we see that in Europe, in the United States, uh, and uh, in, the, uh, in, uh, in uh, Russia, the pressure is not increasing. In uh, some of these uh, zones, is uh, even decreasing, meaning that there is uh, some uh, intervention that has been put in place uh, to mitigate the emergency. But if we look at the South America, Africa, and Asia, we have a strong increase uh, on the human pressure on water resources. And uh, here it's uh, a detail of the spatial distribution. This graph is basically showing uh, the same picture than the previous slide. Again, uh, Afri uh, Africa, Asia, and, um, and uh, part uh, of uh, South America are the zones where the human pressure is increasing more. So what should we do? And I come to my last slide. Of course, we need to take an action. I think we have the means to take action. We know that a lot of research is devoted today to sustainability, to recycling water, and there are emerging technologies that will give uh, opportunities in the next uh, couple of decades uh, that uh, we cannot even imagine today. But on the other end, we have to take into account, as we know, that adaptation requires a very high social cost. So we have to increase the willingness to pay of the citizens. And there is also a problem that I think we need to solve. We need a better connection between science and policymaker. But I think today we are increasingly getting trapped in the need to seek consensus both uh, in uh, the scientific community and also politicians are getting trapped in the need uh, to increase their consensus. Of course, consensus is important. We know that. But on the other hand, I would like to, uh, to emphasize the fact that sometimes a uh, uh, big step forward, significant step forward for humanity have been reached by moving against consensus. So I think it's important that we remind ourselves our respective roles. I think science should provide evidence, sh should support policy making by providing evidence, and the politician should seek uh, the public good, the benefit of humanity rather than merely consensus. I think this is something that we are called uh, as scientists uh, to uh, give a contribution to. I would like to thank you very much for your attention and again for inviting me. We're having some really excellent presentations and I feel guilty about trying to get people to finish a little earlier. But we have one more presentation. Uh, it's going to be presented by... Is it Abdel, Abdel Krim? Abdel Krim Awad. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So those are the ones to go forward. Right. So thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank Alik, Michael, and Katie for inviting me to, to, to come here. So I will be taking you a little bit to capacity building as far as science is concerned. By science here, I mean graduate studies and earlier research science. This is a beautiful place in northeastern Italy, close to Venice. Um, this is a touristic propaganda. Okay, uh, we live in a beautiful city, and this is the city of science in Italy. And uh, in 2023, it will be the European city of science. And big part of this, thanks to ICDP, and thanks to Abdus Salam, the founder of ICDP, that got started a large number of Italian research top institutes in this beautiful city. 
So we're not living in the castle that you see there, but ICTP got started in the castle. Where we are now is uh, basically those uh, horrible buildings that you see uh, back in the middle of the forest. I'm kidding, but the guest houses where we run the conferences are all on the seaside. So uh, all the fellows that come to ICTP, they, they learn physics, but they look also at the beautiful seaside on, 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 on the coastline. So ICDB is uh, basically, we are a UNESCO Category 1 Institute under the science sector. This, is, uh, this has to be very clear. And uh, we, we are founded in 1964, so we're on the road since more than 55 years. And uh, thanks to Abdul Salam, Abdul Salam is a Pakistani Nobel laureate. He got his Nobel when he was the director of ICTP in 1979. And uh, we do we think, we try to do a, a reasonably good research, good science ourselves, uh, because we have to transfer this knowledge to developing countries. And this is extremely important that any time we transfer knowledge, specifically to developing countries, we need to be sure to make sure that the science that we transfer is reasonably okay. So, then we do research, education, and outreach. Then the inception of the center goes back. The International Center for Theoretical Physics goes back. This is a name that goes back to the inception of the center. And it started with high energy cosmology and astroparticle physics. And then later on, it moved to condensed matter and statistical physics and then mathematics. And then later on, Earth system physics started popping up and applied physics and more things that have, do have an implication to the society started moving, moving up, but with the, with the main and the common language, which is physics, of course. So, this is a picture that we show to funding agencies. We like showing this, and the ICDB existed since quite many years, then this is when we started the statistics, it goes back to 1970. This picture, besides the numbers that are not important for me to tell the truth, what we like very much is that we are a global institute. We are not just an institute that works for the good of, the, of developing countries, because if you would like to build capacity in developing countries, you have to involve the Western world or the so developed countries. So this, is, this has to be important. And we struggle to get more women in science. In Earth system physics mainly, it's not a big deal, but in physics in general, this is a big issue, that this is something that we're trying to think about and we're interacting with UNESCO and trying to develop many, many programs that would attract women. Women do it better as far as mainly fighting against the brain drain and also in leading institutions. And this is something that we're discovering nowadays, specifically in some specific countries within the, the South. So we're very proud of what we do in capacity building is because we follow a very holistic approach. We start from the students and up to the senior research level. So myself, when I moved, when I got my position at ICDB, I, I started building a postgraduate diploma program. This is a one-year intensive teaching for students that come from physics or mathematics or very analytical engineering. And uh, during this one-year program, they get a very strong um, theoretical semester, and then they go, and then they, during the second part, they get into either climate dynamics aspects or earthquake, volcano eruptions, and tsunami physics. And uh, this is basically a program that should bring the students from the developing country to a level where they compete with their peers in the West for PhD positions. So this is not a program that fights for the brain drain, but it fights for the brain. There are stars in developing countries that we need to help. And some of these students are ending up doing their PhDs in very, very competitive universities in the West. But we keep track, we keep relationships with them in order to help build capacity. And this will become really an effective diaspora. So uh, the best one or the ones that would like to stay with us as well, they can go into a PhD program. We're also faculty members within uh, different universities in the Italian system. And then we have a, what we call STEP is a sandwich PhD program by which we have PhD students that are enrolled in the South and they come and spend half of their term at ICDP. This allows us to help the individual, but it allows us also to 
try and build a little bit more ethics of science within PhD programs in developing in specific developing countries where this is missing, where predatory journals are taking over, and this is, uh, this is a big issue that we're facing. At the same time, we have programs that do fight for the brain drain, and these are really what we call associateships. These are fellows that do have a PhD. These are people that did a PhD abroad or did a PhD in their home places, but they are very, very good, very talented people, and we give them a contract for six years, and they can come and spend time at ICTB for two months per year. And in general, if they are faculty members, they try always to come during the summer vacation just to keep them doing science and give them all accesses, uh, either high-performance computing or, or excellent libraries or beautiful sea view and so on and so forth, and relax and, and, and get a little bit more oxygen and recharge the batteries. And uh, at the same time, then, uh, uh, our business that is related to IUGG in some way is that we do organize summer schools and workshops and international conferences. In all the fields that I've been listing, we organize 60 activities per year. In Earth System Physics, we do organize 15 that are based at ICDB. And all these activities do look at the different facets of the Earth. Myself, I'm a seismologist. I organize two activities at ICDB, two summer schools at ICDB, and I try always to organize similar summer schools within a developing country context, but always involving Western students and Western faculty and even faculty from the developing world. So this is, these are basically activities that we've been running for 2017, just to show you that we try to, to cover developing countries because we invest our funding and our money in, 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 in the developing world. And uh, right now, we've moved to a level by which we're trying to expand and then we've created these regional centers in emerging countries and one in which maybe I would like just to attract your attention is the one in Rwanda where we just started a master's program in geophysics and then the idea is to build over this master program and then till we get a very vibrant research center. We're right now in the process of hiring two solid earth geophysicists and these solid earth geophysicists are coming also from the Western world and they are ready to spend and go and spend time in Africa. So these are things that we like very much. These are testimonials on how ICTV is doing good. This is Stephen Hawking and the second one is David Gross. David Gross is part of our scientific council and uh, David thinks very high of ICTP and we're very proud of this and this is helping us and Kipping, and he's part of the scientific council, then we're advised by people that do top science and that care about science. Now, let me take you to IUGG. The first person that you see there is KB, KB for the friends. His name is Kalis Borok, okay? Kalis Borok was leading a research activity at ICTB in the time of Abdul Salam called Nonlinear Dynamics, and KB was also the president of IUGG 1987, 1991. He's a, he's a monster. And uh, he helped a big deal of a large number of students from the developing world, getting them to UCLA as well. So and then when uh, KB passed away, when I took my position myself, I started interacting on a very uh, individual base with IASPE and with IAG, with IAVSE. We had very important activities where we came out with important white papers that were endorsed by mm, USGS, by by uh, USAID, by DFID, by development funding agencies as far as how to run international blue sky projects in developing country context, but have those ones always getting a component on capacity building. So capacity building should not be a standing alone business. It has to be connected to top research projects. So the idea behind that we had at that time and then later on in 2012, together with Alec, my colleague and friend Alec, we, we thought that this has to go at really at a, an IUGG scale because we were covering the different facets of the Earth. This includes oceans and atmosphere. And we started a more formal connection and more formal relationship through Memorandum of Understandings. And then Michael came in later on for the second Memorandum of Understanding. And we're running now. We're getting into the third Memorandum of Understanding 
And the third memorandum of understanding will be signed during an advanced workshop on earthquake fault mechanics that I'm running early September this year. And this is also a way to get early scientists and uh, students involved and then PhD students know a little bit more about IUGG. Myself, when I was a PhD student, I didn't know much about IUGG. It was, this is really something that maybe we need to talk about. Uh, yes, so then we're very happy to be, to continue this long-lasting cooperation with, with IUGG and we'll look forward to beautiful results. Let me now give you my feedback as a scientist and as a, as a, a United Nations servant. It's uh, why it is important to work on developing countries. 85% of the fatalities are there, then 85% of the earthquakes are there. And if we'll lose these earthquakes, and then if we have to save lives, then we need to work on these places. And second, we can't afford losing data sets anytime an earthquake happens. And then we need to have a system in place by which all the earthquakes that are taking place within the southern part of the world are monitored, are followed up. I'm right back from Karachi last week. I just landed yesterday here in Paris. and. Uh, Karachi is just an example of uh, a number of mega cities in the West that are basically where we expect large earthquakes to take place. Karachi is sitting right at the edge of the Shaman Fault with its continuation towards the Makran, which is one of the fastest intracontinental faults, and it's sitting at the edge of the Makran, so it's exposed to both hazard and tsunamis. So th these are basically issues that we need to take care of. And the best uh, natural laboratories myself, I would, it would, I mean, talking with even colleagues from USGS in the old time, Ross Stein, for instance, as far as Koalinga earthquake, it would have been difficult to understand Koalinga without looking at El Asnam in Algeria, at Tabas in Iran. So there is a win-win issue when we work on developing countries. These are really effectively outstanding natural labs that we need to take care of. So this is um, fully involved in Earthquake Without Frontiers. That is getting into a, an end. This is a project that was basically coordinated by James Jackson, a very good friend from the University of Cambridge and Philip England. And this was based, this is a map that gets into a risk population density. Just looking at the Alpine Himalayan belt with focus to the continents because in continents, the hazard is more difficult than very localized deformation schemes. The deformation is distributed. And now it's on the base of these maps that we're basically putting priorities on our capacity building. We're trying to identify countries in which we need to work more, in which we need to invest more. And then there are countries where we start from the, from the ground through students. The earthquake vision as far as continental interior, I'm a little bit putting aside subduction zones and uh, Complete, well, localized deformation schemes where we know where the monsters are and, of course, where the secondary hazards are even more important. But as far as continental interior, the background of this map is BAM earthquake and the man that you see there is Morteza. Morteza did his PhD in Cambridge and he's working with us. He's an associate at ICDP and we keep collaborating with them. And right now in Iran, we're expecting an earthquake is overdue beneath the city of Tehran, an earthquake is overdue beneath the city of Algiers, an earthquake is overdue beneath plenty of mega cities. So we do have now, I think that we're doing quite good in earthquake hazard in terms of science, although the recent California earthquake has shown us that, I mean, complex fault systems are popping up that our hazard maps are not handling and then we need a little bit more physics within the, the system then what we are trying to push now, we understood it's clear that we need to go to what this transdisciplinary partnership is about. And the first time I learned about transdisciplinary is talking with a social scientist myself. I always used interdisciplinary and he was explaining me what transdisciplinary is, like I explained the, the representation theorem to my students and that was quite interesting. And there we started understanding that the seismological community has to work with the social community and with historians as well. And that in order to discover pathways to risk mitigation, then we need to build capacity to increase resilience. And this is something that is not within the core mission of the center, but we try to do it through the networks that we have. 
So the networks of science that we have are partnerships, and these partnerships are in different places in the world, just North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, Central American, Caribbean. These are all partnerships that are made of early career scientists and uh, even senior scientists, but these are based on individuals. There is nothing about institutions. We work with individuals. This has to be very clear. And the lessons that we learned is that if you would like to build a partnership, you can't do it just one day before submitting a proposal to NSF or to the European Commission. You need really to sit down and build a partnership a long time before. This is what we keep fighting with our friends from uh, that, that need maybe to work within specific conditions, of course, but this has to be extremely clear the, the partnership that you build with a developing country, this leads into what we call an equal collaboration with developing countries. Developing countries need to be involved from the right start of the formulation of a proposal, not right before the start. This leads to effectiveness. I mean, the effectiveness depends then on the quality, on the commitment, and the trust that you build with, with, with people with whom you're working. So this is an example of partnership and this is a partnership that we have within, this is a regional partnership. They have their own website. We help them to lobby for funding. Actually, this is extremely important. And we want them to be transdisciplinary. And then now, right now, we're pushing them to include the social science component and the, even the, uh, uh, the, uh, the humanities and arts to develop a better understanding as far as responses are concerned and build and bring additional communication expertise to ensure that the lessons are communicated in the best way. So this is something that, uh, that we are not good in, but we're trying to build through Blue Sky projects. So some of my bits here is some of the challenges that I see myself as far as capacity building in earthquake sciences. Developing countries need to be exposed to the best science, and the best science is well reviewed within scientific proposals, but this does not apply to capacity building. There are unfortunately not many institutions, of course I'm using not many, but there are, not, there are a few institutions that are going to build capacity without having a science behind, then just building capacity for, the, for, for, for funding or whatsoever, then we really need to, to have this, um, this point is very important. This leads to the equal collaboration between the, 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 the northern world and the southern world, or the western world and the eastern world. And we always teach one science, the same science that we teach to a student in Ecole Normale is the same science that we need to teach for students in uh, Addis Ababa, for instance. I think that we cannot, we do not need to go and adapt our teaching to, in developing countries. We need to teach the same way, but we need to be good to transfer the knowledge equally. And, uh, it's, it's important to expand the top research projects that are running, where we're running field experiments. The best natural labs are also in developing countries. We need to expand these ones by adding an important capacity building component. And this is something that we're really struggling with. These predatory journals are just a nightmare. And uh, we're, we're fighting against this in some ways by building, by trying to transfer some ethics to our students or to our fellows in developing countries, inviting them not to publish in these journals. But with the main problem that hurts us is to see very good signs published in these journals. So this is a real issue that we do not have an answer to. I don't know whether IUGG has an answer on this. So some of the challenges now, not from capacity building, but in disaster risk reduction as far as earthquake and volcanic eruptions are concerned. Well, there is an issue within the continents that is really a scientific issue that connects to the dynamics of the continental lithosphere versus the dynamics of the Ashana oceanic lithosphere. But this is something that we like. These are things in which we can disagree and talk and spend the good and good, do good signs but the big divide, I think, that was highlighted in, uh, in all the sessions this morning and, and, and in the afternoon is the divide that we have between the science and policy. But myself, consuming a little bit the system in developing countries, I start really to understand that we on the science part need not to stay on the problem side, but we need to be part of the solution. 
it has to be very, very clear. I think that we're seeing, I mean, when I started talking with policymakers that are even former seismologists, they say that the way they observe seismologists is that we're problem makers, seemingly, because we always disagree. So it's good to disagree in science. This is the way science is done. But when it goes to talking to policymakers, there has to be a consensus. This is my own view. So and there is a time scale within the society, and these are things that we're learning from the community-based science and social sciences. And we need to educate communities, and these are the communities that would vote the policymakers. So and these are examples where we've been really, we had a very successful story in Nepal specifically. And uh, the societal memory fades in slow deforming regions. We tend to forget that we're living in earthquake regions because we have a fall that slips at 0.5 millimeters per year. And in those ones where the slip rates are high, we also tend to forget and not learn, and we need to understand why we do not want to learn or what is the reason behind this. And all this boils down to a sort of a long-term commitment that scales with the time scale of the earthquake cycle. And uh, I would like to leave you with this. These are the opportunities in DRR. I think that a global partnership has to be there. Devastating earthquakes are rare in some places, in one single place, but they are very frequent in worldwide, worldwide scale. That's why we need mobility, we need partnerships, we need to learn out of different earthquakes worldwide in developing countries, in the developed world. And the synergies has to be also looked in other natural hazards, not only earthquakes. Building the consensus does not go into scientific issues. We need to disagree in international meetings, but when it goes to talking to policymakers and saving lives, we have to go with a single voice. And we scientists need new modes of communication. This is what I've learned with working with social scientists after five years during in, in the framework of the EWBF. I would like to leave you with this slide. This is a success story in Nepal. In Nepal, we were there before the earthquake. We started everything with diploma students. One of them has a 10-year track in Santa Cruz University now. He's having his own NSF projects running on Nepal. And after the earthquake, we spent a big deal of time even coordinating efforts from different universities where we have collaborative efforts between top universities and ICDP and developing country contexts and getting our students published in very top journals. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for two of those five speakers, and uh, I think we're not too far behind time. But we do have a very short window for a coffee break, so please go there now. Um, and we will have two really interesting panel sessions, which means that this is where the questions will be coming to the, uh, the, the, the experts. Okay? So please, coffee and try to be back here by half past. <laughs> Seats. We have uh, two panel sessions. Um, the first one, as you can see, is on the subject of strengthening international collaboration in science and education in a multicultural and I should add maybe interconnected and fast changing world. So we will have uh, uh, hopefully a much uh, interesting discussion and maybe a lot of debate. Uh, but before that, let's uh, introduce very briefly our, our panelists. The first one on my left is Robin Bell. She holds a PhD in geophysics from Columbia University. She's a research professor at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory in Columbia University as well. And she has been developing technology to monitor our changing planet, has been directing research programs in Antarctica and Greenland, including 10 major aerogeophysical expeditions to study what makes ice sheets collapse. Robin is currently the president of the American Geophysical Union. Next to Robin is sitting uh, Paul Berkman. He holds a master's and doctorate degrees in Biological Oceanography from the University of Rhode Island. He is a professor of practice in science diplomacy and director of the Science Diplomacy Center at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy in Tufts University. And Paul is particularly interested in establishing connections between science, diplomacy, and information technology for good governance, informed decision making, international collaboration. Next to Paul is Annie Kazanev. 
She holds a PhD in geophysics from the University of Toulouse. She works for the French Space Agency and the midi Pyrenees Observatory in Toulouse and is also director of Earth Sciences at the International Space Sciences Institute in, in Bern in Switzerland. Her research is on the application of space techniques to geosciences and in particular she is one of the pioneers in satellite altimetry and its applications to the study of the global sea level rise and she is also a fellow of the IUGG. Next to Annie is Athena Kustenis who is an astrophysicist and atmospheric scientist and director of, the Fre of research with the French National Center for Scientific Research at the Paris Observatory. Her specialty is planetology and in particular the investigation of planetary and planetary moon atmospheres and surfaces. Athena has led space mission projects and ground observation campaigns for both ESA and NASA. She was the president of IUGG's International Association of Meteorology and Atmospheric Scientists and is a fellow of the IUGG. And to the far right, uh, Ligia Perez Cruz is an expert in paleoceanography, paleoclimatology, and climate variability. She's the director of the Ocean Vessels Operations and researcher at the Institute of Geophysics at the National Autonomous University in Mexico, UNAM. Her current projects are related to the reconstructions of the climate variability during the last 18,000 years at different time scales in Eastern Tropical Pacific Ocean. Ligia is currently the president of the Mexican Geophysical Union. So welcome all. I thought uh, to start uh, the discussion, I would put um, a couple of, of quotes on the screen, and maybe I would read them as well, which are from the 1963 IUGG General Assembly in uh, uh, Berkeley, California. And the first one is basically the message from the then United President, uh, States President John F. Kennedy that says science has been given its workers a sense of citizenship in the world and the study of geophysics concerned as it is with the grander and more universal aspects of our common home, the Earth, has given the world its most encouraging evidence of man's ability to work for common purpose. This is taken from the opening uh, talk from his science advisor who also raised a few alarms and I thought this would be good starting points for the discussion today. First one says the following, there is a widespread lack of understanding, indeed a great amount of misunderstanding about science and technology, their methods, their objectives and relations to other endeavors. The general public neither understands science nor is aware of its limitations or of how science and technology go about affecting their accomplishments. In short, as things stand, the public is simply condemned to the continuing ignorance of the forces that shape its future. Then he mentions the problems with funding and says, indeed, many countries spend far too little on support for science and even more important for some on science education. And finally, let me give you one more quote from UNESCO Science for Sustainable Future Initiative that says, creating knowledge and understanding through science equip us to find solutions to today's acute economic, social, and environmental challenges and to achieve sustainable development and greener societies. As no one country can achieve sustainable development alone, international scientific collaboration contributes not only to scientific knowledge but also to building peace. So with that, I have to maybe start by asking the, the first the panel a few basic questions because to me some of these quotes ring through even today, although maybe some of you want to challenge this, uh, this, this uh, opinion. But let's see. So the question is why 56 years later we face still widespread public misunderstanding and mistrust of science. Public science literacy and education have not kept pace and public investment in science and education is inadequate and often decreasing today. So let's start from this set of three questions. You can uh, address them in any way you want. And then I have a couple more sets of questions and then I would like to open the discussion to the audience and if they have questions they can ask each one of you. So maybe I'll start with Robin and if you want you can uh, pass the, the mic around for anybody that wants to respond to these three questions. Is it so, on? Yes. It is on. Well, please, please, please feel free to talk about solutions, not only about gloom and doom. Thanks. Okay, so. No, I don't like to thank talk you. about gloom and doom. <laughs> First of all, happy birthday. 
<laughs> I think we haven't. Not me, but yeah, yeah, I knew, but IUGG, it's, it's pretty amazing that we're here with 100 years. This is why I'm not as, cons I think we have to figure out how we recognize that 100 years ago when these people sat around and decided that there should be an IUGG and at the same time they thought there should be an AGU, they didn't understand even the edges of all our continents. They didn't have the framework of understanding plate tectonics. They didn't really have the understanding of how climate could change. So 100 years later, we as IUGG and the AGU community actually are really in a very powerful place to look forward. And I think globally, the investment in science is increasing. And what we have to recognize is how we can put that positive vision of science moving forward and figure out how more powerfully to connect our science with our communities, because that's how we're going to increase the trust and the investments. And at AG, we have this program called Tech, Th Thriving Earth Exchange, where we connect scientists with communities to address problems. I think we have to, and we heard some wonderful discussions today about how to connect sciences with communities. And I think we have to figure out how to do more of that and reward it with a positive vision for the future. Because I think as we look forward for the next 100 years, I'm now spinning, we were looking backwards. Now we're gonna look forward. Looking forward, we have this basis of knowledge, this remarkable ability to look at our planet as a system that we didn't have 100 years ago. And with that knowledge, which our species needs to keep on living on this planet, we have the capacity to address all these problems and make our planet sustainable. Happy birthday, IUGG. Now, in thinking about the past 100 years, um, one observation is the most basic responsibility of every generation is to offer hope and inspiration to future generations. IUGG was born on the, a month after the uh, um, Treaty of Versailles was signed and settling World War I. If we look at the 20th century, um, not just 1963, but if we look at the 20th century, there are some very fundamental lessons which the public fundamentally understands, may have forgotten, but fundamentally understands. The biggest risk that we face as a civilization is nationalism. Nationalism was the source of the two conflicts during the 20th century. The science, the international element, created a vehicle for nations to come together to think in terms of common interests. And if we think at a basic level on a planetary scale, the, the basic challenge is balancing national interests and common interests, recognizing that nations will always first and foremost look after their national interests. One of the lessons that emerged with the help of IUGG during the International Geophysical Year was the Antarctic Treaty. The Antarctic Treaty emerged during the height of the Cold War, setting aside nearly 7% of the Earth for peaceful purposes only. And I would encourage you to think about the lessons of the, of the Antarctic. It brought the United States and the Soviet Union together to settle disputes in a sense, to, to build the first nuclear arms agreement, to set aside a region of the Earth for peaceful purposes only. Antarctica, as well as outer space, was a source of cooperation between the United States and the Soviet Union throughout the Cold War. The question is why? And one answer to that is that the nations, including the United States and the Soviet Union, decided to build common interests. And the tool that they used to build common interests was science. And so in thinking in terms of hope and inspiration and thinking about the the, the future, the next century for IUGG. There's no ambiguity. We live in a globally interconnected civilization. The 20th century taught us that with the concept of world wars. These were not regional wars, they weren't continental wars, they were world wars. We live in a globally interconnected civilization. The oceans, the atmosphere, the, the lithosphere, all of that are part of our globally interconnected civilization. The challenge that we face 
is to offer hope and inspiration to the future. And just as, a, just as an observation, it doesn't mean handing advice to policymakers. It means engaging with diverse stakeholders at the start, from the stage of questions. When there are questions of common concern, those questions generate the methods, reveal the methods to answer those questions, generating data. And I've heard several times the notion of evidence-based decisions or evidence and decision. Data and evidence are fundamentally different. Data is used to answer questions. Evidence is for decisions. Evidence integrates data and questions in the context of the decision-making institutions. Those decision-making institutions could be governments in terms of governance mechanisms, or they could be built infrastructure in terms of industry. So on this 100th anniversary, IUGG and the, and the Earth Science community, the geo unions, have done a significant contribution to the world in helping us understand our global interconnections. The challenge is to offer the hope and inspiration of future generations so they carry on the work. Thank you, Paul, for the positive example. I think it is good that you, you raised it now. You also mentioned nationalism, but maybe we'll come back to that in the second set of questions that I have for you. So, Annie, please. Okay, um, looking at your first question about uh, public misunderstanding and mi mistrust in science, uh, personally, I am not convinced this is true. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, the general public is in principle interested by science. Uh, for example, in Europe, there is more and more awareness about the reality of global warming. Uh, the problem is that uh, there is not enough offer in, uh, in, uh, in, in science information. Uh, in France, for example, I talk of my country, of course, uh, scientific culture is not really considered a, a part of the culture, like music, uh, painting, and, and so on. Um, to me, the one way to, to solve this problem is, um, is uh, to improve scientific education from childhood uh, by adding more uh, science in, in, in school programs, uh, also uh, uh, encouraging scientists uh, to, to interact with young people at uh, um, elementary and high schools. I think it's very important. And I would like to mention in France uh, the, the program project La Main à la Pâte. I don't know if you are aware of it. Uh, it has been created 20 years ago by a Nobel Prize, Georges Char Charpak, and uh, other colleagues from the French Academy of Science. So it works very well in France at the elementary school. And uh, the objective is to, to interest uh, very young uh, school ch children to, to experiment, science experiment, uh, and so on. And I think it has uh, uh, spread in other uh, countries. Uh, I don't know the list exactly, exactly, but I think more can be done in this respect, and I am sure that the scientific unions uh, can play a role in, in this. Uh, so education definitely to me is a priority. Euh, donc, euh, joyeux anniversaire, l'Union géodésique et géophysique internationale. <laughs> uh, so, um, now I'll switch to English. Uh, I could do this in Greek, but I don't think everybody would follow here. Uh, I wanted to follow up on what everybody else has said. The, the interest in being among the last people in the panel has, is that everybody else has said all the right things before. Uh, but I wanted to stress <coughs> that I also have a pe very positive uh, view of uh, what the public uh, craves. Because when you give a conference, uh, on a Saturday evening and you fill rooms of 500 people who've come to listen to science, to scientific results, it means the public really wants to hear about science. So yes, for sure I work with planetary science and it's nice because I have nice pictures to show, but people are very interested. The problem you have with misunderstanding and mistrust comes with a lot of information we get today from the media. What are people to believe when they get all this kind of different information in the media? 
They hear one thing, then they hear something different, and they don't know how to make the difference. What do you look up these days? When I was a student, I looked up, you know, Britannic encyclopedias, things like that, books written by, you know, knowledgeable people, scientists. Today you go on Wikipedia. How can the public judge what is written and what is correct and what is not? I don't have an you know, immediate solution, but I think one of the first things to do here is for our scientists, we have the duty to look at what the public consults from the media, the general things that they see on the websites, and correct. How many of us go to correct pages on Wikipedia? How many of us take the time to do that? Not very many. But this is where we can interfere. You know, what goes in the media is very important. And so the, the science literacy, literacy and education, I join here, Ani, because I think it starts at school. And you have to have in the school the opportunities, not just for the kids, for the teachers. The teachers need to be informed. And the current generation of teachers are not all of them up to pace with science. They're not all of them science lovers. And they don't have very many opportunities. I think we should teach the teachers on how to spread the science at schools. And at least in France, some things like, for instance, economics. If you take economics, you don't have to take science in the last year of high school. I think and science, in a broad sense, should be taught throughout school. Science is there in different ways for many people. So these are some ideas on your first question. Thank you. It, it's of interest. Excuse me, for a minute. It's of interest to me to hear the people from Europe and North America talk about uh, the media and the perception of science from the public because they're different. And probably in Europe people are more are better informed, including the politicians, while in North America that's not the case. And I'm saying that not from the U.S. side, but from the Canadian side. And I come from Alberta, which is the oil capital of Canada, right? And you cannot talk about climate change because the media is controlled by the oil business and they will be you know, fighting with you the next day. So it is the misperception that is spread by the media, as you already said, but the politicians are fueling this for political gains and very local interests, economic mostly, that are very, very difficult to fight. So um, maybe we'll touch upon this issue again, but uh, I just want to raise this this piece of information because uh, it is different in, in North America than in Europe, really. So, Lee here, please. Okay, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I, s I think I must to say, Feliz cumpleaños, you jeje, <laughs> in Spanish. So, well, um, since my point of view, like, like a Latin American scientists, I think the uh, one of the problem is that uh, the education systems in Latin America are not very good. Since the elementary school science uh, and like mathematic, mathematics and physics and so on, uh, and, and this kind of subjects are not easy for the students. And for example, uh, the, like, um, edu the education, the teachers are not well educated to teach this kind of subjects. So this is difficult for the students to learn or to appreciate the value of this kind of subjects. So, and, um, and unfortunately, the governors, uh, they are not taking care of this in this uh, subject because they are uh, very worried about different kind of problems, uh, urgent problems like hunger, poverty, and different kind of conflicts. So the education is not a priority. So I think this, uh, this is a factor that um, could be uh, promoted that the people in our countries that are not interested in scientific um, issues. So um, maybe uh, due to the, this bad education, uh, the people, the general people, doesn't tr doesn't understand science, and so they don't trust what they don't un uh, understand. So that's 
that's why they are not interested in follow the the, um, the this kind of information or to attend this kind of conference. So in a simple and in other words, for example, the the, stud, the students in the faculties try to get this uh, grade in order to have a better position. And uh, many people said, if you are studying science, you don't have uh, you don't have the possibility to be rich. So try to study another career like um, business administrations and so on. So I think is one of the most uh, well. This is one of the problems that we have in Latin American countries. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from uh, from the audience on this subject? Yes, please. The other one was not. I want to follow on on what uh, Annika Snaf said. Um, she mentioned la main, la main à la pâte, and s I want to inform you that recently a new structure has been put in place by Pierre Lena, who is one of the members of the group who created la main à la pâte. It's called the Office for Climate Education. It has been set up with a group of uh, IAP, the in International. Um, academy par partnership and it's already spreading in the world and the idea is to teach the very young children at the uh, very elementary level about cl elementary thing on climate education and I think there is two unions in the uh, set of union uh, IUBS and IPSIS who have started a program on education for on climate and that means more, we are in touch with them, obviously, and we are working with them. But more union could join on this experiment. They just need to go on to look for Office for Climate Education, or OCE, and join the group because it's a worldwide experiment. And the idea, basic idea, is that you should teach the young children, they will teach their parents. And you have more chance that it works than if you teach the parents. Yes, excellent point. Thank you very much. You, you also raised the, the issue of the unions themselves getting involved with promoting their science and education, which is not happening too much. I mean, it's happening at the ICTP level, we heard in the, in the last talk and so on. But I think we need to go down to the elementary level, as you, as you said, otherwise uh, another speaker said here. Actually, this covers some of my questions that I have here not these two, but the last two, which is basically on the education, you have covered them already. Uh, maybe the last one uh, is something worth revisiting because coming from a university, I believe there are barriers within the university system that does not allow us to do a good job in uh, you know, multidisciplinary education. So I can say a lot of things about these things because I'm personally fed up, but I would like to hear from maybe, maybe from the panelists. So. Does somebody want to, to, men to mention something on this aspect? This one is on? Okay. Is this on? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, that's really at the convergence question yes. that we heard from Marsha yeah. on how we can actually bridge our sciences and address problems. And I think it's actually f to absolutely fundamental to how we're going to move forward in the next century that if we must figure out how to keep all the disciplines at the table, focusing on a problem, and so both the educational institutions support it, but also the research foundations, those who support us, and the uh, publication process, because if we, or we simply accept that we can't publish this sort of more applied or convergence work. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's just education where there's a barrier. I think it's both the will of our community, but I think the hope there is that convergence work is inherently going to address a problem. And while we may not have done the best job at educating the next generation, the next generation and the millennials are very keen 
to do something socially good. So this is the part of our science where we're going to have the strongest capacity to bring in that brain power that we need. Yes. Well, I think the, you, the key point is that with, through education you can improve things in the next generation, not, not now, and this is going to take time. But it does have to start from elementary school, I believe. At the university level, we'll a little bit have missed the point at the moment because, you know, I'm coming from an engineering, not a science school, right? And we are basically regulated by professional engineers. And all they want is, you know, produce an engineer that knows nothing but engineering. They can go the first day to their job and, you know, work for the company. End of story. But, no, uh, but there is hope, right? That, yeah, but they don't worry about social sciences having any, any people uh, skills or anything like that, right? And so when they regulate the program, they do not allow you to change it so that you offer more courses from social sciences and more interdisciplinary courses and, and even projects for, to the students. So that is a current problem that we, I don't think we can overcome it very quickly because the university administrators also do not see that as a problem at the moment. But isn't it so. our job to f change it? Because I don't know mm. about you, but I wasn't trained as a convergent science. My, my PhD is in gravity. Ne neither was I. And last yeah. time I checked, gravity, while it applies yeah. to everybody, isn't yeah. really solving a convergent problem. Yeah. So I think that we all have the capacity to broaden. Yeah. So I think it's fostering that sense that this is a goal of our, of our community. Yes. And it will help attract students who want to do that. It's, it's often said the, to have interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary, it's necessary to break down silos. I would argue that each of the silos, each of the disciplinary training has value. People can bring strength to the table. The challenge is to think of the umbrella that, that is involved. And one observation is that the natural sciences, the social sciences, even indigenous knowledge, they all characterize patterns, trends, and processes. They use different methods to derive those patterns, trends, and processes, but those patterns, trends, and processes become the basis for decisions. And so in a sense, there's methods that, that are involved with generating data from questions, and there's actions that are involved with the evidence and the options. And the, the apex goal, in a sense, is an informed decision, a decision that operates across a continuum of urgencies. At the scale of nations in the world, that continuum starts with security timescales that are immediate, dealing with the risks of political, economic, and cultural instability on one end. And on the other end, there are sustainability timescales that deal with balance between environmental, economic, and societal issues across generations. And it's not one end or the other. And this continuum of urgencies operates at the level of an individual. If you're driving down the road, you have to be aware of the cars on the right and the left, and you have to be aware of the red lights in front and think about how to maneuver, as well as what's coming up from behind. I think that the framework that's involved with teaching, in a general sense, is not as broad as it could be. And perhaps the, the opportunity is to, is to recognize that research and action are separate phases of decision making and that the research, the questions that are involved are part of it. They're the starting point, that the opportunity to build common interests among allies and adversaries alike. So I would, I would say that the, it's a work in progress in, in, in that sense. So you're going into science diplomacy now. So ca can I ask you maybe to say a few more words about science diplomacy and diplomacy in science and, and, and science for diplomacy and so on? Because I think it's a very interesting topic uh, that uh, maybe the audience would be interested in as well. So a few years ago in 2009 at the Royal Society at the Wilton Park in England, there was a meeting among ministries of foreign affairs and they came up with this, this tripartite definition of what science diplomacy is. It's science for diplomacy, diplomacy in science. And it always seemed more as very superficial to me. It still it begged the question of how does science diplomacy operate? And it was at the level of foreign ministries. In effect, we, work, we live in a world that has nations at the center um, since the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. We became international when nations began to bump into each other in terms of international, the, the League of Nations and then the United Nations. And today, we have a world approaching 8 billion people and subnational has become a component of this jurisdictional element. And so 
in a sense, across this spectrum from subnational to international, the challenge is to promote cooperation and prevent conflict. It happens at local scales, regional scales, national and international scales. And the education component, I agree fully with everything everybody said. It must begin at K through 12. And I would argue that in the world today with smartphones and, and internet and so on, the, the training that's involved is more than mathematics, reading, and writing. There's a skill associated with informed decision making, methodology, and, and theory behind it. How to train informed decisions. And I believe that the education stage of K through 12 is part of lifelong learning. The research stage emerges at the scale of universities and leadership effectively emerges in professions where people become decision makers. Okay. Well, boy, time goes very quickly. So maybe I will ask the audience if they have any comments on the educational part or any good suggestions for us. Uh, yes, please. Uh, thank you, uh, John Burroughs, University of Bremen. Um, so I enjoyed very much uh, the session and some interesting comments. I'd first of all, I'd like to make a point that we are making progress in diversity of science. When I look at our panel, it's no longer white or gray, white men in gray suits. Okay, so we're beginning to move a little bit in this direction. I think with respect to education, it's nothing new. Aristotle and, uh, uh, or basically going back to Aristotle and, and uh, um, the um, Jesuit founder, both recognized that if you take a child for seven years, you get the man or woman, you might say nowadays. And therefore, the issue is educating for the next generation. So it's the schools which is the key issue. Uh, you can't create university professors by, from a, from a class of one in a hundred, promoting that one person all the time. Uh, you have to do uh, that, and that's the issue, is at schools. Uh, with respect to transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary, I might show your, share your view, which is that there's a lot of smoke and mirrors on this one, and uh, it would, it's essential that IUGG and others stand up for the disciplinary base of natural sciences. Okay, uh, working in environmental science sort of for the last uh, 45 years or so, I would say that environmental science is seen as easy option, uh, which is completely wrong. It also attracts then sometimes people who think it's an easy option. And we must, education has to be changed to, we may have to go to five year degree courses. Uh, people are living longer, they may have to spend more time in education. I don't think it's easy to cl cross the barriers. And I, I really see at the moment the move towards transdisciplinary as being far from successful. Thank you. Is there any other question or comment? All right, if not, let's move. Oh, Ani, you have a comment on this one? Uh, I want to move to the uh, next set, but go ahead. What? go ahead. Because I am a little lost. Which yes. question? The last one? Or? Well, the educational any, part. Any, any, the any, educational any. part. Okay, anyone. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I think all these questions are a little negative. Uh, personally, I am more optimistic. And, uh, okay, just a few comments about international collaboration. Are there obstacles or barriers? Uh, so, as we have heard uh, today and uh, earlier in the, this afternoon, there are a lot of programs uh, developed uh, by IUGG, the International Association, but also in the context of uh, the World Climate Research Program uh, for climate research. Uh, there, are, there is also Future Earth. All these uh, international bodies uh, have a lot of research projects uh, which uh, involve uh, scientists worldwide. To me, the, the, the main problem is uh, funding, uh, national funding, uh, because uh, to, to, to be involved in this uh, international project and so on, we need funding. And uh, I don't know in other countries, but uh, Again, in France, uh, funding is uh, decreasing and decreasing. So this is, uh, I think this is really a problem. The other uh, problem I see, and I don't know what is the solution, is that uh, it's uh, some countries or some regions of the world are not involved, or scientists from some region of the world are not involved. Uh, for example, uh, I would say Africa. 
and uh, there is a, a big challenge there for in particular for for the scientific union to attract uh, scientists from less um, represent how do you say less participating countries so yeah. Well, thank you for this comment. That, was, that, that takes us to the next set of questions, which is the barriers uh, that we have in terms no, of... No, I, oh. I understand, but I, um, the, questions, the set of questions you've put here touch on the other questions that are yes. more focused afterwards, but you have one important point here, which is the barriers to the free circulation of scientists and data sharing. That, that, is, the, that is an important point because everybody knows that not everybody, not all scientists can talk to all scientists. There are regulations that have actually uh, prevented some of our scientists to come to Montreal recently. There have been also other places where we cannot discuss with scientists. For instance, if the, you're in the U.S., you want to talk to Chinese, it's not as easy as that. Back and forth and data sharing is not something that is global today. So I think this is a very important point on which IUGG and all other you know, unions and associations should work upon. Somebody said this morning, science is a universal language. Uh, thank you very much for this. But do not forget the other people, the other stakeholders. And if science is, is a global language, do not forget uh, engineers. Do not forget industry. Do not forget the commercial sector and every other partner coming in. So a suggestion would be that I would GG, scientists is great, but maybe they should open up because talking to an engineer, or talking to somebody from industry, or talking to the commercial sector, I found I have to adopt my language. I have to learn a completely different language and understand what they're saying. Mm -hmm. So communication and is a very important thing, data sharing, communication. I think we should open up to all the stakeholders, whether they be political or from other fields. So just wanted to respond. Well, I think we are. I mean, I am an engineer, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. So, but I think we have to open up, but in the sense of attracting them into our community and we going to their communities as well, because they won't come to us. I think we have to have the first step of going to them. And to me, that includes the involvement of the developing countries. We do not have to have our general assemblies all the time in the developed world most of the time, right? We should find ways of going there because, you know, they won't have probably the money to do it themselves, but if we help them, then we could really uh, uh, enable them to, to come into the family and uh, for us to go there and have more research and development locally and so on. So I think requires money and time, of course, but uh, I think that's the way that we have to proceed. So um, I don't think we have too much time. We have another maybe five minutes. So again, I want to open it to the audience for any general questions to the panel or comments on this or any, anything else that you would like to discuss. Also to the speakers from the previous session that we don't have enough time. Hi, I just had a proposal maybe, maybe um, considering more remote participation possibilities to engage parts of the community that are not able to visit meetings. Yeah, thank you. Any more comments or questions? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Very good point. We need to have continuous presence, otherwise, as you said, it's, it's very difficult to achieve this. And one of yes, the things Robin. that we do at AGU to sort of ensure both um, engaging people from around the world and trying to really make sure we have diverse views from gender and culture 
on interactivities. We really consciously try to populate our, our um, all the committees and all the work we do with people from, we actually look to make sure we have a balance of genders and a balance from people from around the world so that we don't, so that we have that support system when we want to go and we have those connections. So it's something to keep in mind and to be very proactive of. Because I think it's, um, we do see that the young populations are in science are in Asia and Africa. You know, that is where science is growing, and we want to make sure they're engaged in the union. Uh, and I, I also wanted to add, I know you have it in one of your next questions. Um, I don't think the situation is so desperate for gender balance and, and cultural mixing because, um, I, I mean, circumstances and people change. And, for instance, you know, the world wars, one and two, that you made reference to, Paul, previously helped into bringing women forward, showing that they were capable to do several things. And today, at least, we have some laws and rules. So do we need another world war? No. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, we evolve faster than what people were, would be thinking previously. And the communication means today, email, for instance, makes it so much easier to talk to people and exchange information, you know, on science results and so on. So, indeed, I, I join you in saying that I think it's more positive than we thought it was uh, previously. Uh, yes. And it won't take another 100 years before we... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I just want to add that the gender balance is yes. well represented mm -hmm. here today. <laughs> yes, it's very good. So eh? <laughs> I, well, okay, about the Lisa. barriers to free circulation and scientists, yes. of scientists. I think Mexico is not suffering this situation because of the wall. Uh, so, and due to, yes, it's a big problem. And so due to the, the people that are trying to cross the border. In the past, in a few years, uh, Mexican scientists and also students uh, uh, went to the United States to study or to work. And currently, now this collaboration is decreasing due to this kind of problems. So, and I think the people is looking for new collaboration in Latin America that should be good, but mainly in Europe. Now the collaborations with, with uh, European uh, consortiums are increasing, but uh, this is in long term a big problem for the Mexican, uh, for also for the, the, the people from the United States that try to collaborate in Mexican project is also a problem and I think it's not good for this circulation or and from the science in the, that problem that uh, had the, the two countries. For example, the droughts in, Har in Arizona or in Mexico in the Chihuahua Desert, so uh, problems with water or climate change or whatever, so they are, we share the same problems and we cannot attack the same uh, uh, with, the, with the same strategies, and unfortunately, we are now divided by the wall. Yes, thank you very much. That was my next question. And last one, I assure you all I had no intention of having negative questions, but uh, I wanted to stimulate the discussion, and I think we achieved that. And the message in the end is positive. So thank you all very much for your participation and your positive messages. I think we all have to work together to achieve these things, or at least start, start affecting a change. Uh, for the betterment of, of society in general. So, Paul, you have something else? I just wanted to, um, I guess, emphasize what, what Haida Hackman has initiated in terms of bringing together the International Council of Scientific Unions and the International Social Science Council. It's a, it's a significant change in terms of evolution and of, this, of this international science activity. And I certainly, in this discussion, the IUGG can pay, play an important role in terms of helping to bridge the natural sciences and the social sciences. Mm -hmm. And the only other observation I would make in, in the world with eight billion people in it, subnational is becoming increasingly important. So a state like California is the fifth largest economy on earth, larger than the United Kingdom. And so in terms of funding and support, uh, it may be helpful to think in terms of subnational collaborations as well as national collaborations and international. Okay. So let's thank the panel.
Thank you all very much. I think the next panel starts right away, right? There's no break in between. So, Alec. Good afternoon now, and may I invite uh, experts for the next panel. Uh, it's uh, Michael Rast, Harsh Gupta, Heike Lan Langeberg, Detlef Stammer, and Christoph Vanderberge. First of all, I would like to thank you for accepting invitation to come to this event and to be a part of this, uh, I would tell, exciting uh, a day. Uh, exciting in terms of the expertise which today we see in this hall. It's uh, varying from the different fields and the different uh, areas. Unfortunately, you see the one chair is empty, and that is a reflection of the one of the previous panelists that uh, IUGG should bring more people from industry. We tried to do it, but probably it's a too high level. We invited uh, one of the richest person of the world, and uh, because it's uh, our leadership, I actually met him last October, and uh, we had a very simulating discussion with Carlos Slim uh, about the future of science, science education. And we invited at this time already him. He, uh, well, in general, positively accepted, but telling that it's, he is uh, quite busy and we will, he will see if it will be possible to fly for a few hours to Paris. But unfortunately, he couldn't make these things. But it's, uh, what is important, definitely, the financing of science is the one the important issue. Sometimes the, the people argue about this point, telling that it's, oh, well, there is, a, for example, mathematician Perelman, he didn't, doesn't need a money, but he is a doing brilliant science, well, science, mathematics, actually. But, well, it is a one point, and even, you know, there is a, a President uh, Putin, when it meets with the uh, leadership of the Russian Academy of Sciences tells, always when I arrive to your meetings, you are telling, please give more money, more money, more. but your colleague, look at the, never ask money. Even he is offered one million dollars for his uh, research, but it's, uh, he rejected this thing. Anyway, this was uh, just a remark before we will start our panel, and I would like very briefly to introduce our experts here, panelists, and you will have a uh, you have uh, in the uh, our uh, program it's the extended uh, uh, bio of the uh, our experts. But I would like to introduce uh, it's exactly the same uh, way as Michael did from the left to the right. The uh, first we have with us uh, is Heike Landerberg, and uh, she's an oceanographer. But what is the most important? I found that you are a mathematician. You know, me too. I am a mathematician. And when I was a boy, I told her the mathematics is brilliant science. You know, you put a theorem, you prove the theorem forever. But it is a science, it's just a fighting, and it's a collecting evidences and so on. But it's exciting. Thank you very much that you agreed. And the, uh, hi, the, uh, uh, Heike, sorry, uh, she's today is the chief editor of uh, Nature Geoscience. Harsh Gupta. Harsh Gupta is a very special person because he contributed dramatically to the uh, development of IUGG for the last about 20 years, uh, being at very different positions, including the, the presidency of IUGG. And Harsh Gupta also is a very uh, instrumental person in terms of the disaster risk uh, reduction in his country and in Asia in general. And he was a member of the National 
disaster, uh, uh, disaster Management Authority of India under the presidency of uh, Indian, uh, uh, sorry, under the chairmanship of the Indian president. Uh, thanks, Harsh, also. Uh, now about the Detlef Stammer, he is uh, a scientist, oceanographer uh, from Germany, but today you are not invited in this capacity, but you are invited in the capacity of the chair of the Joint Scientific Committee of the World Climate Research Program. And today morning I told about the first chair, it's the Professor Bolin, and now you are last in terms of the uh, you know, the election terms. <laughs> you are the recently elected chair, and we uh, really would be interesting to know more about the climate, climate variability, and so on. Thank you for agreeing to be with us. Uh, Michael Rust. Michael Rust is a, is a scientific advisor to the European Space Agency. Uh, and uh, or for Earth's Earth observations program, and it's very nice that today you are with us. Uh, they uh, unfortunately they uh, Joseph uh, Ashbacher couldn't attend, but uh, thank you very much that you agree at a very short notice to uh, uh, come and to join uh, this uh, uh, panel. And we are expecting you will tell about the how Earth observations in general really affect this triad. I will explain now what is this. And finally, about this uh, Christoph van der Berger, it's a uh, really pleasure that you are with us today. Yeah, I know that you are just appointed to be a chief of the Earth Science and the Disaster Risk Reduction uh, section of UNESCO, and you was uh, uh, also very, very helpful at the stage of the preparation to this event. Thank you for uh, joining this session, uh, and uh, we are very happy. Now, uh, could I have the next slide, please? Uh, well, uh, when we are speaking about 21st century uh, the triad or triad, this is a, uh, something which uh, uh, probably you can argue that it's, we have a more agendas in UN. Uh, however, today is a three very important agendas. It is a uh, 2030 agenda for sustainable development. It's the uh, agenda uh, Paris Agreement as well as a Sendai framework. Uh, about Sendai Framework today, our uh, guests from the UNDRR already uh, introduced you these uh, challenging issues, especially related to implementation of the Sendai Framework. But I think it's all the programs, all agenda have an uh, issue in the implementation because it's all we have to convince governments to not only sign and agree <laughs> with uh, something, but it's uh, to also push it in each country to uh, at the implementation stage. I think that's uh, very important. That's uh, uh, actually something which uh, we wanted during this uh, brief uh, session, with, uh, short session which we have to discuss about the three major issue. And what is the important? It is, uh, uh, well, uh, we can argue that it's uh, science evidence uh, should be generated to convince the governments that it's, uh, science is important and so on. But sometimes we have a lot evidences, we have a lot of science to be presented. But the way how we are doing it. May I have the next slide, please? And here are comes questions, and the questions to general questions to panelists. And uh, first of all, it's uh, what is the role of science in the implementation of the sustainable development goals, climate change mitigation, and disaster risk reduction? And another three, actually, this is uh, something about the communication. It is uh, maybe it's, I highlight it is important this communication because it is uh, sometimes we are thinking about communication as a one-way, uh, you know, strategy, but it should be truly two-way uh, road. Uh, to reach, and that's uh, probably transdisciplinarity comes here at this uh, point, and how we communicate, how to communicate scientific evidences, uh, what scientists need to do to ensure that effective dial dialogue with the stakeholders exists, and what is the role of traditional international uh, the science focused organization, for example, like IOGG, play here. That's the uh, questions which I wanted to address to our panelists. 
And uh, first, I would like to uh, ask uh, again this way. Next time, I will come from the right to the left. <laughs> and Heike, please, what do you think about this science and communication? Okay, so I think, I think the role of scientists um, in policy advice should be like a critical friend. So I think um, the idea should be, first of all, to listen. So what are the problems that need solving? Where do the where does society have a, a question? And then try to frame the problems potentially in a way that it can be treated with science. So for example, we had a heat wave. Every heat wave comes, people ask, was it climate change that caused this heat, wave, this heat wave? And that's a question that science can't answer because there's a lot of natural variability, there's a lot of change anyway. Um, so we need to rephrase the question in a way that we can say something meaningful and helpful, but um, we can also answer it. So the, the, the way in this, in this way is to go to a prob probabilistic framework and say, what's the probability that this heat wave would have occurred if there hadn't been any global warming? Um, and then you can say, okay, the, the likelihood has tripled or quadrupled or is tenfold now. And that's an answer that the public can understand, that policymakers can understand, and that is scientifically meaningful at the same time. So I'm trying to say communication works you know, as a, as, a, as a good friend, as a critical friend, you go to the, listen to the people, what are their problems, redefine the problem, and then give advice as best you can. Um, there's also, you, I don't think, somebody I think said we need to keep things positive. Uh, that's true, but I think it's also important to ask the critical questions that are on the table. For example, we want to become a carbon-free economy by the middle of the century. Do we have enough land to generate enough energy? Solar power requires land, wind power requires land. We still want to preserve biodiversity. We still want to feed the world. We need a lot of land to do all that. Is that possible? Can we do a, a rough calculation? Can we come up with other solutions to problems? That's probably then the, the, the work of engineers and not the work of scientists. But raising these questions is really important. Do we have the minerals and the metals? Solar, um, the solar uh, panels need a lot of mineral metal resources. Wind energy needs a lot of me me metal and mineral resources. Is there, is there enough mining going on? Do we need to expand mining? Then how do we raise acceptance for mining if we want to do that? It, you know, there are trade-offs to be made. This is a difficult discussion. So I think one of the big, big points of science is to understand where other stakeholders come from what their interests are and to try and take these things into account but basically act as an advisory c capacity and not prescribe anything. Just say these are the options, these are the problems, here are difficulties that we need to solve in other ways. So that's perhaps my thing. Thank you very much, Haki. You really raised the very important issue of this link and specifically how scientists to uh, should communicate this uh, to government. I think it's uh, harsh next to you. It's uh, really those experts who worked for government at a very high level. That's why it would be very interesting to learn immediately from Harsh how he did particularly for the Indian government. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Alec. First of all, I must compliment you for putting these questions together. Very well thought out. And uh, I will address the disaster risk reduction and try to go through all the four questions through that. You see, we have been hearing uh, quite a bit uh, this morning. Also, Fernando talked about that earthquakes are expected in many places. And uh, the fact remains that uh, we are in the 19th year, 20th year of the 21st century. And uh, in these 19 years, we have lost more lives in earthquakes and tsunamis than the entire 20th century. This is in spite of the technical and all kinds of developments. So there is something missing somewhere that the fruits of the work that we do, scientific and technical, are not getting translated in benefit of humanity. So we took up uh, a case that uh, earthquake prediction is not around the corner. Agreed, but even if I tell you that tomorrow a magnitude of eight earthquake would occur at a specific place, what will you do? People cannot run away. So 
to prepare an earthquake resilient society is the crux of the matter. In that direction, uh, we took up the case of the 1905 Kangra earthquake, which at that time claimed some 20,000 lives. If you take the isoseismals of that earthquake today and put the typology of houses over there, you can get an idea of how many houses will get destroyed. And if you put the layer of population density, you get to know how many lives are likely to be lost. And when we did that, it was staggering several thousand people, several hundred thousand people. So we got worried, and, but then we saw the Zafarabad earthquake, which occurred in 2005, only of magnitude 7.6 claimed 80,000 lives. And it occurred late in the morning when everyone is out. And mostly in our part of the world, the houses kill the people. So what should we do? So what we took up, we took up the five states and we had a year long campaign that how we prepare for it. To start with all the lifeline buildings, what are the vulnerability of these lifeline buildings to be able to tolerate the anticipated accelerations? What should we do with that? Then there was a total uh, involvement of the public, state government, and after this exercise that what we should do, how we should do, how the hospitals should be managed, we had a mega mock drill in February of 2013 where the virtual earthquake occurred at 11 o'clock of magnitude 8, and there were hundreds of observation points where we saw how public responded to it, what the hospitals did, what the people who were responsible for taking out the various uh, issues, they did it, and we found a lot of lacunas. So the best part which happened out of it was a, a sort of a eye-opener that where we are and how we can help it. That gives me a way to communicate to the government that by this kind of exercise, you can improve the situation, and then you can have an effective dialogue with the stakeholders. And finally, I come to your last question, that IUGG can play a very important role by replicating similar exercises elsewhere in the world, because that, I believe, is one of the best ways of handling the situation. Thank you very much, Harsh. That's a really quite important that it's how, how you looked at the issue. It's a from the beginning, science, society, government, and it's a coming to the, it's a how, how we are our, for example, union or the other international union can really play a role in this issue. Thank you, Harsh. Uh, now I am moving from disaster risk to the climate change, and that's a quite nice you are. Uh, you know, you find the seats, you, I have not jumped to another, it's, uh, because it's uh, two related issues. Climate change generated, today we know there is uh, disasters in many cases, and that is a very important to look to this nexus of the uh, really three major uh, agendas of United Nations. Uh, could you please tell uh, uh, about the how your organization World Climate Research Program uh, really not only generates science, we know that the best science, actually I was a little bit, it's, uh, you know, concerned that it's, uh, when uh, IPCC got the Nobel Prize and it was uh, not mentioned that it's uh, uh, really science are developed by the WCRP and this uh, IPCC got it because they analyzed the science developed by uh, WCRP. But well, you will be recognized as well. But you are recognized, actually. Your program recognized. That's why I would like to hear uh, from you. What do you think about the science, science role, and proper communication, this climate science, to society and to government? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I hope this <laughs> works. Um, uh, first of all, uh, co uh, congratulations to your um, centennial anniversary um, birthday. Um, I should say that um, the World Climate Research Program also has its birthday this year. Um, it's much younger, it's 40 years, um, not 100 years, but in fact, um, if you look back uh, 40 years from now, um, what was in fact the goal, the mission that the WCRP in fact started out with? That was um, to uh, investigate the, the variability of the climate system and to demonstrate or to investigate um, the human impact on climate. 
And um, essentially over these uh, 40 years, um, the climate research um, community uh, made an enormous progress in that. In fact, um, it was uh, uh, this 40 years where the, the impact was really demonstrated through many developments uh, that included observations, global observations, the climate observing system as well. In fact, the, the, the climate models that are now capable of, in fact, simulating uh, the climate system. And so a lot of information came out of this development that at the end, um, on your previous slides, I mean, 2015 was a pivotal year in, in history. Uh, and, and a lot of this depended really on the information that came out of the World Climate Research Program and other scientific international organizations. And we are sitting here for IUGG, but there are yet others um, that should be mentioned. And so a lot of that information was developed. And, and so in that sense, um, uh, many of the decisions um, that have been made so far, also the development, like the uh, sustainable development goals, um, came out of all this information. Of, they still um, include a lot of uh, science, um, uh, for instance, on climate change, and information that needs to go into this. And so one of your questions here, what is the role of science in implementing, implementation of the science, uh, uh, sustainable development goals? I think there are great goals. Um, some of them are actually conflicting. It's not even clear if we can reach them all at the same time. And I think there's a lot of information required to do that, um, not just from natural science, not just from climate science. In fact, a lot of that is social dynamics, social science that is required uh, in, in the interplay. And of course, um, climate science is sort of reaching through a lot of these. And so you really need the information also in the future and to some extent, that boils down to more information, to more regional information about climate change, about disaster development, about better information. We have heard um, sort of the tsunami or other uh, warning system. There's a lot of information that you need to feed in. And I think the climate community really need to work now much more on the detailed information on the interaction with the stakeholders to develop, in fact, the information that is required by the stakeholders. Um, and in that sense, yes, there is a lot of information required and the World Climate Research Program as well as others now gear up to be ready to produce this sort of from the success that we had already, uh, start new goals, start new development, actually get rid for, uh, ready for purpose for, uh, for, for what the challenges ahead of us. And yes, that, that will be the new WCRP um, over the next 40 years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tesla. Uh, now I would like really to move to uh, Michael. Uh, I am surprised how well you are uh, sitting in this row. It's not a jumping and so on from one top to another. Observations. Today I think it's uh, nothing can be done without the observations, without data, which we're accumulating every day at the enormous amount. We are speaking about big data and so on, but uh, let's now to speak about observations. You are from the agency, one of the uh, well-known agency, European Space Agency, which uh, collects a lot of information to help science to really do uh, their job, I would like to tell. It's, uh, because without data, we cannot generate a lot yeah, to contribute to societal issues. Could you please tell it's, uh, how really these science evidences help, for example, you to convince the governments in Europe, because you are from the uh, European Space Agency, to uh, really implement those agendas which we are speaking today as well. Well, um, thanks very much, first of all, for, for having me, and apologies from Josef Aschbacher that he couldn't come today, but he wanted me to extend his congratulations to IOGG's birthday, which uh, here with is, is done. Um, yeah, it's an honor to be here and thanks for your question. It actually ties nicely in with the general questions uh, that you have up there. Um, the advantage of satellites, and that is what we are basically um, doing it at ESA, at the European Space Agency, is design, develop, launch and operate spacecraft in Earth observation, of course, to observe um, the, the Earth as a system. And there we provide robust, long-term, independent, also over areas which are on the ground, not accessible, data over longer time spans, which, which, which give us the, the possibility to, to get to the bottom, to look at drivers of processes and components. 
And I think in response to your question one, without Earth observations from space, from our satellites, um, we wouldn't be able to serve many of those SDGs. We wouldn't be able to serve uh, climate change analysis um, mitigation, but what we will discuss next, deep adaptation, and surely without disaster, uh, without our satellite data, disaster risk reduction would not be possible. And I think none of the triad of the three components would be what it is today without science, not only the one from space, but generally science is underlying all those process drivers. Now, may it be greenhouse gases or may it be the warming of our oceans. Here I come to your question concerning the evidence. I think the unequivocal evidence for uh, climate change or accelerated climate change is happening is sea level rise. And nothing can observe sea level rise as accurately as our satellites. And, and one of the pioneers in this research is actually in the room, and she was on the previous panel, Annika Kazanav, who, who, who is really um, been supporting groundbreaking science in that, you know, up until five years ago, as of 1992, we had a sea level rise of 3.1 millimeter per year. Uh, in the last five years, we've seen that it's basically um, uh, ex not exponentially, but near exponentially rising. We now are between 4.8 and 5 millimeter sea level rise per year, and that you can only observe from satellites. So that's the evidence you were talking about. This is the easy bit of the question. Now I come to the more difficult bit of the question, which is your second and your third question, because how do we communicate with governments? How do we communicate with stakeholders? And le let's, let's look at all the, yes, the general public wants science and is interested in science, but let's look at the facts. I've, I've just been looking at the followers of a pop star. And a pop star like Rihanna has 90 million followers. <laughs> and the European Space Agency, who is actually uh, the the in non-UN international agency with the most followers has only 900,000. Okay, so not 90 million, 900,000 is a difference. Now, in Earth observation, we only have 50,000. Why? Because in space, astronauts and planetary science like flying to moon, flying to Mars, landing on planet, uh, on, 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 um, yeah, is, is more interesting than what we are doing. And if I may borrow the title, we are really propagating, unfortunately, at the moment, what is called an inconvenient truth. And um, our politicians are not always interested in that. Yeah? And particularly politicians with business and industry, they are, ti they, they are tied and connected. They have, and it, I saw it on one of the slides this afternoon, um, they have a, a, a governing span of three to four years at a minimum. Um, and the processes we are talking about and the mitigations we are talking about based on satellite evidence takes a lot longer. So our inconvenient truth is sometimes difficult uh, to, to get through and to become a little bit more popular, even with the big data that we do and even with the interface that we have between scientific-oriented satellites and the increasingly operational satellite scenario that we have. So in that sense, what, what could we do is for the science to possibly also simplify a little bit the messages. And um, I actually didn't want to quote Friday for Future, but I have to do it as well because these youngsters, they have been shaking up politicians. They have managed to do things that we, even with our evidence, have sometimes not been able to do, like I want you to panic, I want you to behave as if your house was on fire, which let's face it, actually, it is. Huh? And in that sense, I think if the messages of science are a little bit more simpler, understandable, and if we start transdisciplinary to learn to speak with the same language, which in the different science disciplines we do not always do, then we probably have a better chance to get through. And in that sense, last point, um, science-focused organizations could really help in supporting the harmonization of practices and procedures of formats of the way that information is derived from the data. And it was, several, it was mentioned several times in the session after, after lunch is, is the transdisciplinary uh, work that between the different earth science disciplines, you know, the geosphere, hydrosphere, biosphere, and atmosphere, if we could make those link a bit, a bit stronger, we would march together and probably be a little better posed. 
Thank you very much, Michael. It's a really, it's a something touching about the inconvenient truth. That is a fantastic. You know, as a mathematician, we know that there is a so-called uh, uh, problems in mathematics, which is uh, uh, called sometimes ill-post problems. And the idea of mathematician to turn this ill-postness into well-postness, and then to solve the problem. Now my question is, in general, not an answer right now, it's, we have no time, but it's how to convert, this is the inconvenient truth, to convenient truth, such a way to convince the government to do it. You know, that is a mathematical problem. I I just want to say, sorry, I didn't want to talk about the inconvenient truth, although it, it goes to that. I think what you said is, is very true. The Fridays for Future have shown, I think, that we don't need to explain better. I think we have explained well enough. I don't think we need to simplify the science. I think the information is out there. If those school kids understand the house is on fire, the politicians could understand it if they wanted to. I don't think that's the problem. I think the problem is it's too difficult and they don't want to be seen to be uh, unsuccessful. So uh, it, it, I think, I think uh, the idea that scientists need to explain better and in, in other ways is probably not going to get us anywhere, frankly. I think, I think the people who want to know understand and they can understand and they have all the information they need. Well, yeah. Thank you for the comment, actually. It's very interesting. However, there is, uh, there is uh, some complications with politicians. That's why we have to find it, because it's a, a lot of things, a lot of evidences were com uh, really collected in terms of the science and the knowledge, great knowledge. But sometimes how to properly communicate it, probably by end I will tell it some interesting story. Now, Christoph, you are from the only organization of United Nations which mandate is science. And uh, how really this organization, UNESCO, especially a uh, section which you started to lead, uh, it uh, contributes to this link between nations and between science which you are promoting here in UNESCO. Thank you, Eric. Is the microphone on? Yeah. Uh, well, congratulations, first of all, with your uh, anniversary, and thank you very much for uh, hosting it here. It's a real honor for us uh, to be part of this. So um, thank you very much for that. We ourselves, we're only 75 years old, 74 actually. So we're going to be 75 next year, but we're going to be sure to return the favor. So I hope we, we, uh, we set up a great uh, event next year. Now, if you look at the uh, UNESCO, uh, the S in there doesn't stand alone, and I'll, co I'll come back to that later, but that, that's giving part of our strength. But the S itself covers much more than just the natural sciences. It also covers, as you've seen today, uh, the uh, ocean sciences, uh, IOC is part of that S, but also the social sciences. And we've heard it several times today. I think that's going to be uh, something that we are going to explore much more in the future. Um, this S also covers a wealth of intergovernmental and international science programs. And we house here the uh, IHP and the hydrological program. We also have IGGP. Uh, we have IOC, as I mentioned before. We have the Man and the Biosphere program. And all of this allows us actually to link biodiversity to climate change, to disaster risk reduction, and this whole complexity as we've seen here uh, in these uh, global agendas. Now, I think the challenge is indeed how do we tighten all this better together, because if you look again at the symbol of UNESCO, then you see that it's built out of several columns, several pillars, and unfortunately, it still acts a little bit like that. And I think it's a, it's a very clear ambition of the new Director General and of my ADG that you've heard today, and to make sure that we strengthen that intersectoriality in the future. Because, if, let's be clear indeed, if you analyze each and every SDG, they're all underpinned by signs. There is no way around that. Uh, now, towards your question of linking uh, the scientists with policy, I think that these intergovernmental and international science programs are really allow us to make this linkage to a certain extent. And the IGGP alone allows us to get in touch with over 5,000 geoscientists worldwide. And this allows them actually to give them a voice towards the policy level. That's one way. The same with the hydrological uh, program, the intergovernmental uh, hydrological program, 6,000 water scientists, water experts that are in direct contact with the policy making level. But still then we notice that indeed there is a bit of a gap between 
let's say, scientists and policymakers, and, and we're really looking into this as well. How can we convey that message much clearer? How can we convey the scientific evidence in a, in a way that it's understandable for policymakers, or that at least that it trickles their interest? Very often we've seen that, well, leaders uh, appoint a, a science advisor never to ask any question whatsoever to that person. So I think it's, uh, it's important that we make sure that scientists are, are communicative or at least that they are savvy in, in that sense as well. And, and that takes a particular training. That's, it's a discipline in its own. You cannot expect this from every scientist. And that's why we're working together with the, um, uh, with the ISC uh, and through the uh, INGSA, the uh, International Network for Government uh, Science Advice where we actually set up trainings in particular uh, for scientists to make sure that they do convey that message and that they package it in a way that is understandable because it's not so much as we said here before in, in making the message simpler or in making sure that the evidence is understandable at the, at the level that can be understood by an outsider. It's also a way of communicating built on concerns, for example. You have to build it on something that is understandable for them and how it affects their life. And it's actually showing much more the scientific or the, the, the societal relevance of what they're dealing with in their discipline rather than the facts because just convincing people with the facts will be very tough and we've seen this as well in the climate change uh, discussions. Maybe the complexity of the geosciences is a little bit larger in terms that yeah you're very often dealing with themes that are very hard to, con to communicate right it's, it's mining it's uh, the extractive industry it's, it's fracking uh, how to it's, it's about uh, carbon storage uh, it's about uh, um, yeah, themes that are probably a little bit more complicated for society and where you meet a certain adversity, there's a certain gut feeling and instinct that, that you, you're, you have to face immediately. So it takes a certain approach to, to break through that. Thank you very uh, much, Chris. And maybe, sorry, if I may yeah. come back on this later. Um, oh, yes. Just on, on the last question here yes. on IOGG, what role you could play. Just picking in here on, on what was just said as well, I think it's in incredibly important to uh, communicate with youth as well, with young people, young scientists, but with youth in general. Uh, they are the future, for sure, but they also have a way of communicating that takes a, 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 a specific approach. And I've done a little bit of a research as well, but we know that, for example, in other disciplines, and we're here very much committed in, I would say, popularizing science in general, and, and, and in particular, basic sciences, it's a bit of a challenging factor here. Uh, but then we work very much through YouTube uh, channels and through social media in general. Uh, if you look at, I've, I've done a bit of a search here on the most popular geoscience blogs, the American Geophysical Union. They reach about 6,000 people. Uh, the American Geoscience Institute has about 7,000 followers. If we look then, for example, at blogs that are uh, working specifically on mathematics, only for the Spanish-speaking uh, region, for example, they reach over 700,000 subscribers. So I'm not sure if it's just that geosciences is less sexy. I think it, it's, it takes a certain approach as well and a, co and, and, and a particular approach, a particular communication to reach people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christophe. Uh, I would like to open the discussion to uh, our guests. Our, uh, yeah, uh, here first I think was uh, uh, our guest from the IUGS, president of IUGS, yes, please, yeah. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Chumia Chen. Of, uh, President of uh, IOGS, uh, the International Union of Geological Science. Um, first, I'd like to congratulate for the uh, celebration of the uh, 100th uh, anniversary of IOGG, and also thanks for the invitation to be here. Um, speak uh, from a point of view of geoscience, um, and also um, as a uh, newly appointed member of Science Planning Committee of uh, ISC, International Science Council. I think it is a very good opportunity for me to hear from you about science, education, collaboration, and so on. So, so regarding the, um, the question you have over there, the first and the last those two questions, um, particularly um, what, what a science, uh, the rule of science in implementation of uh, SDGs and also what um, the roles of uh, unions uh, uh, can uh, play. So I think uh, um, I have a few uh, comments here. I think from today's uh, discussion or presentation and talks, we can clearly see that um, the uh, two unions or IUGG particularly you have um, been playing uh, leading roles and two sides with 
many other organizations. Um, and f for example, most of the highlights of the contribution of the YUGs of the last 100 years, including the invention of uh, plate, tec uh, plate tectonic theories and many other aspects, involves collaborations of, of all uh, two science communities. So I think the collaboration is, uh, you don't have to say, I mean, this is uh, something very neat. But today, I think we're talking about our science, or Jew science particularly, um, are, uh, how say, uh, more closely related to our societal development and the human life. And that's probably one of the reasons that we need more collaboration. Collaboration, um, not only of natural science, science, but social science, engineers, uh, other field uh, and the science and the policy makers. So I think that uh, is, is the situation. Now the question about how we facilitate our collaboration, I think we need to know what is our problem is. So I think our goal is that to, uh, to contribute as much as possible to the SDGs. And if we, if we check that we study the SDGs, we realize that person science is responsible for all SDGs, including water, energy, hunger, food, soil, the environment, education, collaboration, and so on and so on, just to name a few. So I think this is our kind of immediate goal for us to, to collaborate. Now, the problem is that what we are lacking at the moment is, to, to my view, is that we are kind of uh, being held back by our ability to bring data together to support the research, studies, education. Uh, and so we are not fully benefit from the digital revolution at the moment, okay? I think probably partially because our data, geoscience data is very complex, diverse, okay? It involves space, time, and also cover, you know, different spheres and so on. So I think that is uh, uh, the, the nature of our data. So, we lack of a network of first science databases to serve, for example, like one-stop link, like Google. The society, this uses Google to almost everything. But in first science, we do not have such a system to link all our data, our data in different format, in different technology, even among us, hard to communicate you call this and others call that. Therefore, machine could not understand our data. Therefore, we cannot use machine to learn our data to help us for the data discovery. So I think that's, that is the kind of a situation that, to my view, the earth scientists or earth science, in comparison with life science, medical science, physicists, we are kind of behind in terms of uh, using data-driven approach to help us to do our research, our promotion, our education. So I think that is uh, something we could do. Michael, I think it's ready to answer your question. Yes. <laughs> the, yes. The, there was actually 14 or 15 questions in the one you just raised. Yeah. And, I <laughs> and I try to do it very, very quick. Um, in ESA, we have two Earth observation strands the research-oriented explorer scientific satellite program and the operational one. And the Earth explorers, the, the research-oriented one, lead into operational programs. And trust me, nobody would want the operational data if they were not quality assured or, quali or calibrated. And I can say the same for the colleagues on the ground. The ground measurement systems at the moment of the measurement network speed for atmosphere or, or for water on ground are very well calibrated and so are our satellites. Nobody would get the big sentinel data that we are at the moment distributing of our operational series 
if it wasn't quality assured. And here I come to one of the oldest policies of the European Union, which is the common agricultural policy. They are now using our operational sentinel data in their policy because they are quality assured and because they are calibrated. As far as education is concerned, yes, I agree with you, we need to do more. But now to, the, to what you said, very interesting point, um, we haven't exhausted the techniques and technologies of sometimes diverse data sets. That is only partially true because there is a very big effort by intergovernmental organizations such as the Group on Earth Observation, such as the Committee on Earth Observation Satellite to harmonize practices, processes and procedures and data formats. And we are at the moment working with deep learning, machine learning, artificial intelligence in short to get those big data sets together. Side remark, at the moment we are acquiring 50 terabytes of data a day and distribute 150 terabytes. That would be two times the big ben on top of one another as DVDs per day in terms of data. And we're trying to make them globally accessible, but also try to get to the big data problem by applying artificial intelligence. So I tried to be as short as I could. Thank you very much. Uh, last question from uh, Orhan Altan from International Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing. Thank you, Alec. Uh, first of all, of course, uh, congratulations for this centenary. Uh, I think this is not, all of them are four differ uh, different questions. Every question is interrelated to each other. But I want to come to some, uh, especially the sciences, uh, scientific evidence and the policy makers. We have to translate our scientific evidence to the policy makers. Because the policy makers, they want to be sure that the scientific evidence solve the problems they are facing in the politician, political decision making. And this is the one of the most important things. And uh, we have also with the joint unions together made also the several attempts at the special disaster risk reduction and showing them the decision makers best practices in different areas of disaster risk management, showing them. And a very good institution which I observed in the last years uh, is the, what Harsh Gupta has uh, established a very wonderful institution in India, INGOIS. He is contributing to different parts of, for the politicians, for the society, for the uh, economy, and for everything, for the disasters. The effective dialogue with stakeholders. We have to define what type of stakeholders we want to define. Politicians, okay, we, know, we have to find a way. And the other one is business. We have to find what uh, scientific evidence they get from economy. The best business is related with economy. What type of economic uh, gain I can have when I use this methodology? And this is very important. The other one is the society stakeholder. This is very important. We have to uh, communicate with all these four different stakeholders. But for communication, we have to understand, each party has to understand each other because every stakeholder has a different jargon. And with this jargon, we need transducers, we need translators, etc. And this is very important. Yes, please. Yeah, I think this, uh, this is a uh, very interesting and excellent comment. I, uh, well, I, would, I would like to make a, a response to that. First of all, I completely agree that the society is one of our major stakeholders. And um, I do agree that it's always difficult to communicate, in fact, our results to, um, to, to the policy makers. Um, the IPCC process is exactly this. Uh, every so and so often, the science basis, the knowledge is assessed, is actually translated into uh, recommendations for policy makers. There's a huge process of doing this word by word is being negotiated. Everybody agrees in the room. In fact, in COP21 in Paris, all nations agreed that we have to limit the emissions. Otherwise, we will not reach uh, two degrees, let alone 1.5 degrees. 
from the IPCC process, from WCRP, the community has shown, and everybody agrees on it, we have to come to a zero carbon, net zero carbon emission community. We can wait for the policy politicians for making decisions as long as we want. We need a major sign, a societal uh, transformation. Everybody needs to be involved, and I don't think we really should wait for the policy uh, makers to, to do this. We all need to uh, participate in this, and the society is one of our major stakeholders, and, and we need to communicate. The, the young kids have have understood it. Basically, they will go out, they go to the street, we have only one word, world, that's what they tell us, and, and do something. I think the point that you have raised is extremely important, and uh, it becomes our responsibility that uh, the signal is loud and clear, because politicians would like to hide or take that some scientists say something, other scientists say something else. And uh, that's where the evidence-based uh, information becomes very important. And IPCC is a very good example. As a matter of fact, Ali, you will remember that we tried a lot that IRDR should have a lineage similar to IPCC, but that, anyway, it is in the process. If that had happened, then things would have been a lot better. But I think very positive question from you. I would like to thank our panelists. Thank you very much for uh, simulating, actually, these uh, uh, presentations. And there's uh, a lot of things we will uh, bring, I think it's at home, to think about. Thank you very much, and it's uh, for your way of the communicating science as well. Thank you. It's the usual story when things get really interesting and we get warmed up, we run out of time, which I'm afraid is what's happened today. Um, so I'm just going to make a couple of announcements um, after we do two remaining uh, awards. So first of all, um, if the representative from Belgium can come and collect the gold plaque, So the uh, original person due to uh, receive it was, is not able to be here, but we're delighted to have a representative taking it on their behalf. <laughs> and the second was, I think we all agreed that the IOC should be really getting theirs as well. So. <laughs> Um, while, while I remember, several of you have been asking about whether presentations will be um, available after the event, so we're in the process of contacting the speakers for permission to share the presentations, and attendees will get a message uh, when um, presentation material is available. So we are hoping to share as much as possible of what we've heard today. So really, I'm just going to wrap up with a few short notes of thanks. So um, Chris and I this morning chaired um, some, a whole series of talks, you know, and you probably thought that we've been working really, really hard to get all these speakers and wonderful speakers and everything into place. Nothing could be further than the truth, by which I don't mean that they weren't wonderful speakers because they really were, but we didn't do the work. So most of the work for putting this program together was done by Alec, our immediate past Secretary General, and our past President, Michael Sideris. And that's been done in conjunction with Franz here and his assistant, Katrin, who really worked incredibly hard to um, put together this wonderful program that we've been part of today. And I mean 
just not just the, um, the talks as well, but also the panel discussions as well, which I think have really stimulated some ideas and some things that the IUGG is going to be able to think about and hopefully make progress on over its next century. Another person I'd like to thank is Joanne Jocelyn. You've all, I think, got a copy of the history volume that she and Alec have put together. If you want to know where you're going, you have to know where you've come from. So that's the information and the, the legacy that they have provided for us uh, by making that wonderful volume. I'd like to thank all our speakers and panelists for, for really stimulating, thought-provoking, informative presentations. I'd like to thank our green shirts. You'll have seen them. Uh, these are local students who have been providing logistic and other help for us to run this meeting. And I'd particularly like to thank UNESCO for hosting us all today. And maybe we can give everybody a good round of applause. So we have two wonderful finales. The first is going to be an orchestral performance, and in the moment I'm going to vacate the stage so they can get set up. They're going to say a few words about themselves, and there is obviously information in the program, so I'm not going to delay things any further. Um, and then after that, we're all going to adjourn to the seventh floor. And to get to the reception, we need to go back out to the entrance where, um, there and then take the elevators up to the seventh floor, and that will be where the reception is held. And um, I hope that you'll think we, we all deserve an orchestral performance and a cocktail reception after this, although it's, you know, it's just been fantastic. So thank you all very much again.
Thank mm-hmm. you.